it um, um, as letter B under that report under the Milton School Committee goals. I'll put it there. Um, and then I'm going Recording to- Recording in progress. I'm going to remove the um, subcommittee um, conversation for this evening. Um, and I don't know if there's anything else that I, that anyone would like to add, change, delete. No? Okay. And I need a motion to approve the agenda of the October 6, 2021 meeting. I'll move that. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. All right. Uh, this will be a roll call vote. Uh, Member White? Yes. Dr. Carroll? Um, yes, but I want to go on the record with a, a wonder or question about why we're moving the subcommittee. Because um, I didn't have a chance to, oh, shoot. I didn't have a chance to speak to, um, I didn't have a chance to review something um, before the meeting tonight. Okay, but it will be on our next agenda? Yes, for approval at the next meeting, yes. Okay, yep. thank you. Thank, thank you. Us. I appreciate the, the question. Um, uh, Member Rostini. Yes. Dr. Elaine, uh, Dr. Elaine Craighead? Yes. Member Rosmarin? Yes. And Member Eberhardt, yes. Okay, wonderful. Then we'll move on to the superintendent's report. Superintendent Chen? Thank you, Chair Eberhardt. Um, we have the honor of having uh, a couple of members of the Milton Public School leadership team and principal of Milton High School, Karen Cahill, and director of math, uh, K-12, through Brian Selick, and we have a member uh, from Quincy College, Megan Cassidy. She is the Associate Vice President of Student Success and Partnerships. And uh, uh, Karen Cahill, Principal Cahill, came to before the school committee earlier in the summer to talk about a dual enrollment opportunity, particularly for high school students. And this is a, a follow-up to that session. And for this session, she brought brought along with her Megan Cassidy. So I would turn it over to Principal Cahill at this time. Thank you, Superintendent Jett and members of school committee and Assistant Superintendent Sheehan and Dexter. Um, as Superintendent Jett said, I spoke before you in person, I believe it was in June, in regards to uh, potentially starting a dual enrollment program at Milton High School for any of our students that were interested. Um, I understand that there are questions that um, the committee has in regards to the effectiveness and how we can make this program access accessible for all of our students that are interested. Um, I feel strongly that dual enrollment is something that Milton High School can offer our students and encourage them for college ready, college and career readiness as they look at opportunities that are beyond Milton High School. We have a very robust um, advanced placement program through College Board, which is separate than a dual enrollment program. And as Superintendent Jett said with me this evening, as Brian Seelig, head of the math department and Megan Cassidy from Quincy College. Um, if this is something that we will move forward with, we are moving in, in baby steps, if I can say it like that. One of the courses that we're looking at to start off is our statistics course at Milton High School. And that is why Brian Seelig is here this evening because following Megan Cassidy's presentation, he will answer some questions along with myself and Megan in regards to why we feel statistics is the best course for us to start a dual enrollment program for at Milton High School. Um, so Megan Cassidy will start this presentation. She will be sharing her screen. She'll be giving an overview of the dual enrollment program at Quincy College, the districts that they currently work with, the cost of dual enrollment, dual enrollment at Quincy College versus other community colleges in the area, and um, some of the enrollment data that she's uh, collected over the years in regards to the courses that they offer, the number of students that enroll. And then Brian, as I said, will be following up in regards to um, why we feel statistics would be the best course for us to start with, and then other courses that we can do down the road. So if that is okay with members of school committee and superintendent, um, I would like to present Megan Cassidy from Quincy College to start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Principal Cahill and um, Mr. Selig and all of school committee um, for welcoming here, me here this evening. I am gonna go ahead and just share my screen. Um, so hopefully folks can follow along. So just give me one moment and I wanna make sure that everyone is able to see that. Is that appearing for everyone okay? All right, fantastic. Um, so as Principal Cahill said, uh, my name is Megan Cassidy. I serve as the Associate Vice President of Student Success and Partnerships at Quincy College, 
been there about um, three and a half years and in the time that I've been there have had the privilege of really helping um, to have a hand in the organization and really the streamlining of not only our dual enrollment programs, but other pathway programs and most recently an early college high school program that we're launching this fall. So it's been an excellent opportunity to kind of see the ways in which we can combine the internal support services that we're offering our students and really expanding that outreach to um, high schools and local communities. And so this evening, it's really an opportunity to hopefully shed some light on the dual enrollment program that we offer at Quincy College, highlight some of the successes that we've had, and then um, as Principal Cahill shared, talking about what this could look like within the Milton District. So again, I do appreciate your time. I wanted to start with just a brief overview of the dual enrollment program as it functions at Quincy College. And I do believe folks should have um, these materials as well, but if there are any questions, please let me know. Overall, um, dual enrollment, the way it functions at Quincy College, is an opportunity for the students in high school to earn Quincy College credit while they are still in high school. And one of the unique aspects of our program is that the students are earning this credit while they are still um, now at least physically in those high school classes. I know last year a lot of that was remote, but the students are not required or expected rather to attend classes at the Quincy College campuses. They are earning that credit while they are still in their high school classroom. So with that comes obviously the benefit of the familiarity of the teachers that they're working with and the support services that are available. Also, when we talk about accessibility of these high school, um, or excuse me, of these college credits, again, the students are not taking time out of their school day or needing to travel to a campus to earn those credits. They're earning them right at the high school. It also, um, you know, is a way for students to acquire that college credit and really put on their radar the post-secondary education and opportunities. Um, I know a lot of students are coming in already with the understanding or with the goals of certain schools that they might want to attend. But for those students who maybe haven't given as much thought to it yet, it does lean into that convenience. With that too, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but um, the college credit transferability. So the credits that the students would be earning for say a statistics course, or if there were other courses down the road are treated as a Quincy College statistics course. They would leave or rather complete the course with a Quincy College transcript. And as our academic advisors and um, our guidance counselors at other dual enrollment programs do, is they work with the students to help them understand how those credits can transfer, um, not only to Quincy College and schools that we have articulation agreements with, but other institutions as well. Um, also regarding the idea of college readiness and just putting kind of planting that seed for a lot of students of what does um, you know their goals and kind of path look like after high school. And then finally, we do find that a lot of high school instructors who are teaching these dual enrollment classes um, really appreciate the opportunity to connect directly with our academic leadership and faculty at the college. Um, there are a lot of conversations regarding curriculum alignment, development, particular activities, um, specific outcomes that are related to that course. And then also the high school instructors um, really seeing themselves as an extension of the Quincy College um, instructor community. So we do welcome all of our high school instructors who teach a dual enrollment course as an associate instructor of Quincy College. Uh, we've also had a few of those instructors actually teach as adjuncts with our college as well. And so it's a nice way for um, the instructor to also kind of have that added sense of, um, or that added professional development experience as well. And again, this is a, a collaborative effort, which I'd be happy to speak more about. Along with the kind of overview benefits of um, the dual enrollment program, as Principal Cahill was mentioning, um, our dual enrollment program comparison. So we currently, um, charge a tuition of $300 for a three credit course that a student would be earning through the dual enrollment um, program. $400 for a four credit course, which typically includes a class, a science class that has a lab component to it. Um, if you compare to Bunker Hill with their dual enrollment program, you'll notice that a three credit course costs about $660. 
and then right around the same for Cape Cod Community College for a three credit course. As a lot of folks probably know, Quincy College is, um, you know, really prides itself on how it does remain competitive financially um, when it comes to just overall tuition and cost of credits. And so for a student who's earning credit through dual enrollment, they are actually experiencing a savings of about six to $800 from a just normal Quincy College course. So it's a tremendous savings to the student um, and to the family earlier on in their college career. And we do recognize that sometimes that is hard for students or even families, especially a lot of our first generation college students to really contextualize what $300 for a three credit course really means. And so through the work that our dual enrollment partners do with the college, we really try to um, make sure that guidance and dual enrollment instructors have a robust understanding of what this savings means and what it really can mean for those students in the long run. So I thought it would be helpful just to kind of outline um, our current dual enrollment partners, as you'll see on the screen here. Again, in the past, three, three and a half years that I've been working to really streamline and kind of reorganize our dual enrollment program, we have found that it is obviously most important to have that trusting quality relationship with our high schools. And so while we look forward to expanding this list, um, I can confidently say that we have contacts and strong relationships with all the folks that we currently work with. Um, we were really excited to have Weymouth High School um, join the program and they've launched um, their dual enrollment program this fall and it's been it's been wonderful working with them. So as you'll see, kind of an overview of a lot of the schools that are in this area that have been participating. And one thing that I'll talk about um, in one of the next slides is that all of these schools have a different amount of dual enrollment courses. So there is no minimum or maximum that a school has to have when it comes to the courses they might be offering. So if we did start with perhaps one math class or one psychology course or whatever the case may be, um, that is a, you know, it's a great place to start. I know this slide is a little bit hard probably to see, but again, happy to send any of this out afterwards as well. But I just wanted to highlight some of the growth um, and really evolvement that we've seen with registrations um, over the past few years. So um, we did have a dip in registrations during um, the pandemic. And then last, this, this most recent um, academic year, was able to build that back up um, overall. So you'll kind of see that we went from 400, a little over 400 um, in 2018, 2019, dipped down um, during 2019, 2020, and now are back up to um, over 530 registrations um, this most recent year. As you'll notice too in the um, chart down here, there is um, a lot of variation between the number of students um, that participate in the dual enrollment um, course offerings and that register for the credit. And then again, you'll see the number of course offerings does fluctuate by high school. Um, what we do find is that there are some high schools like um, Greater Lowell that um, only offers one dual enrollment course currently, but they have a significant number of students that participate in that one dual enrollment class. And then we have other districts that offer a variety of dual enrollment courses, but maybe don't have as many students in each of those classes. So just to kind of give everyone an overview of what that can look like. As I was mentioning earlier, um, for our dual enrollment students, they do earn a Quincy College transcript and Quincy College credit upon completion of the course. They do need to complete the class with a final grade of a C or higher. Um, we use that as the benchmark because that is the grade that a student needs to receive at the college in order to um, have the credit be transferable in general. And so this is a look at some of the institutions that dual enrollment students have um, had their transcripts sent to and have attended um, after participating in our dual enrollment program. What we find is we have a lot of students and a lot of parents who will reach out with questions about, you know, my son or daughter is in a dual enrollment physics course, but they're looking to go to Suffolk and we want to know if it's going to, um, you know, count towards their degree that they're planning to pursue at Suffolk. And so we will work with them. We always connect them if they have any questions with our advising services as well. But one thing we do always remind 
uh, high school students and families and, and our students as well at the college is that when a student decides that they want to either transfer to a four-year institution or attend a four-year institution, it is always ultimately up to that institution, whether it be Babson or Bentley or St. Anselm's, to decide how that credit is applied to that student's particular program of study. So a student who's pursuing a STEM degree um, might have to take you know, a, a specific chemistry course at that certain institution. And perhaps the dual enrollment course comes in as an elective credit or a core class that they need to complete. So what we do is we work with the student um, to help them understand how those credits can be transferred um, we have students who also participate in our articulation agreements, which is an agreement with four-year institutions um, with the understanding that all the credits that the student earns through Quincy College will transfer into the specific program at that four-year institution. But I did think it was helpful just to highlight, um, you know, kind of the array of schools here. And so what we have found, like any program, we want to be continuing to assess the overall experience of our students. Um, what we have found is that the main student reason why students stay enrolled in the dual enrollment course is to earn that college credit and pursue that next step after graduation. And we found that most students learned about the dual enrollment programs actually from their high school instructors who are obviously teaching these courses. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do do a lot of promotion with um, the guidance offices and obviously making sure that the academic leadership teams at the high schools um, are aware of this opportunity. But the students are learning about these um, a lot of the times through their teachers. And what we've done with other districts as well is partnered with the guidance counselors or even certain departments, um, in this case, perhaps the math department to say, um, are there opportunities for Quincy College to maybe answer any questions at a parent night or at an open house, or again, whatever feels appropriate to that high school. One of the things that we really try to focus on with any high school that we work with is every high school is unique. There's unique students and there's unique needs that they're serving. And so we, once the agreements are, are put in place for a dual enrollment program, we want to support as much as the high school really wants us as a support. So um, that's again an ongoing kind of relationship and um, communication with the high schools. And I just wanted to close with um, a, again a, a few takeaways um, from a student from the dual enrollment student survey that we conducted last year um, and just some of the comments that our students did share with us. Um, one of the things that I think is important to highlight um, well, all these remarks really, but the one here about um, the student who mentions this didn't interfere with my schedule. Again, it's not something that's added on that they have to worry about. Um, it should be, you know, something that's really embedded into their high school academic experience. They're earning college credit um, and also, you know, working towards obviously their high school um, graduation and completion along the way. And I know that in talking with um, both Principal Cahill, and then turning over it in just a minute to Mr. Salig. Um, I can clearly see that Milton is an incredible community, and you know we would obviously love to, um, to talk about the ways that we can partner together. And to most importantly, I think, make sure that the college is supporting the district in a way that helps the students be successful. So again, I do really appreciate the opportunity to share this with all of you this evening. And I do want to turn it um, over to Brian at this time. And as Principal Cahill said, happy um, to answer or clarify any questions as well. Thanks, Megan. Thank you uh, to the school committee um, for having us. Um, I want now to um, explain the rationale why we've identified our non-AP or honor statistics course at Milton High School as a, a appealing uh, candidate uh, should we be able to move forward with this dual enrollment partnership with Quincy College. Um, and I, I pulled a little bit of the enrollment data here in that course as it compares to the AP statistics course. And these numbers are fairly representative of uh, the past few years as well, but this is current data. Um, and in fact, actually, we've seen a nice uptick in our enrollment in AP statistics this year compared to the previous two. 
Um, but if we just kind of look at this year um, and the number of students, and in particular, the number of 12th grade students um, who are enrolled in AP versus non-AP statistics uh, this year, we see a significant difference. Uh, we also see um, more racial diversity in the non-AP uh, as opposed to the AP. Um, and so one of the appealing uh, thoughts about um, identifying the honor statistics course for this opportunity is just the number of students that we can potentially impact with it. Um, you know, I think part of uh, what should be discussed tonight is understanding that dual enrollment is different from AP um, and that they're not in direct competition with one another. Uh, we're not trying to uh, deter students from taking AP courses in favor of courses that um, might be part of our dual enrollment partnership with Quincy College. Um, and there's a difference also in how students in each course end up with college credits in the end. As uh, many of you I'm sure are familiar with AP courses, you have to uh, achieve a score on the AP exam that uh, the institution you decide to attend will accept and, and grant you credit for, which is often a three or better, but sometimes only a four or better. Um, whereas, as Megan described in the dual enrollment, it, there's no exam at the end um, that, that students need to be prepared for. They're, they're sort of earning those credits over the course of the work that they're putting in um, in their Milton High School classroom with their Milton High School uh, teacher. Uh, and so I think that needs to be um, emphasized. Um, so beyond just the number of students and, and, the, and the greater diversity of students that we could reach by um, this partnership uh, through Quincy College, I think that our statistics course is also uh, a prime candidate because I feel like our curriculum is already college level. We've had it anchored towards a college level statistics course and we've taught it um, with the rigor and expectation uh, of college level uh, material. Um, and then statistics itself is just an appealing uh, subject area for this opportunity. Um, I think we want to incentivize uh, students who um, are not uh, expecting to major in a STEM-related field after high school, um, and who maybe even entering senior year are not sure what their post-secondary plans are, to view statistics as a really relevant and really worthwhile subject area. Um, and it's also for that reason, in large part, why a lot of colleges have shifted their math requirements um, away from calculus, except in the case where students are going to be pursuing uh, a STEM related major. And instead, um, for some of the liberal arts and um, some of the social sciences required statistics as the, the math course that students in those majors uh, need to successfully complete uh, toward that degree. So we would be giving um, our students potentially a, a leg up kind of in that, um, should they head into that direction uh, after um, high school. Um, and then I just wanna also wrap up by saying that I, I came from a district, uh, a partner district with Quincy College. I was, uh, Megan and I did not overlap in that regard, but um, you know I, I was not directly involved necessarily in the partnership, um, but, um, I found that um, the partnership that Megan described was very uh, accurate to the experience that my district that I came from had in working with Quincy College. Um, and so that was just another reason where I felt this was something worthwhile to bring to Milton and an opportunity for our students. Uh, the last thing that I want to speak to is specific to um, this idea of um, providing an opportunity, particularly for our, our students of color. Um, I, I, I think it's important to note that black and Hispanic students are earning post-secondary degrees at half the rate of white students and that that gap is growing. And I think that um, where we can try um, for our students um, to um, encourage and incentivize and help them uh, see themselves as uh, capable of post-secondary work and of getting uh, a step forward in earning a post-secondary degree that we should um, really consider that opportunity carefully.
Okay. Thank you, Brian. Um, Megan, if you can stop sharing the screen, if that's okay. Does anyone have any questions or comments that they'd like to reflect on at this point for Brian, Megan, or I? Uh, Ms. Gale, do you want to call on people you would like me to call on them? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to do it if people have questions. I think I can see everybody. You Does see anyone a have a hand? Okay. I think I can. Sure. I'll, um, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, and it's exciting to, to think about this possibility for our students and um, especially Mr. Selig, thanks for kind of contextualizing this in our, our own data and um, kind of our goals as a district. Um, I guess following that, my question is um, relating to the cost and the possibility for scholarships. Um, Ms. Cassidy, you, you kind of gave good information about where Quincy College is in relation to peer institutions with how much you charge for the dual enrollment three credit course. Um, but I remember last spring when we talked about this, we were raising the questions about, um, you know, how to ensure that cost would not be a barrier for students to take advantage of this opportunity, um, which is all the more important given what you just shared, Mr. Selig. So um, is there an update on that? Have, have we been able to identify a plan or what sources of funding there would be to ensure that cost wouldn't be a barrier for anybody, especially given the high, it's the 90, um, you know, it seems like the pool of students that might be eligible to take advantage of this could potentially be a rather large group. So where, where would that funding come from? So, so if I can speak to that, and Megan, feel free to jump in if, if you've had experience with other districts as well. Um, if a student, in, in my opinion, is, is doing this for that college credit, I do think the student needs to have an invested interest in this as well. Um, you know, for a student to realize that this is something they can do at the high school level, they're getting the high school credit for it and the college credit for it. Um, there has to be a monetary investment on behalf of the student. As far as the district, um, I have not been part of a conversation on fundraising. I, I don't, fundraising as, I don't know how else to say that or supporting the students financially from the district perspective. Um, I don't believe my understanding and Megan, please correct me if I'm wrong, that financial aid um, is something that with the reduced cost already for the course, mm -hmm. because the course is actually, the courses at Quincy College are more expensive, that this is the course that we can, this is the rate of the course that we can offer for students. Is that correct, Megan? That is correct. And um, thank you, Principal Cahill. And, and thank you for the question. So um, there is not financial aid directly tied to a course like this. Um, the students taking the class, even if they were um, just a current high school student taking a class, one class at Quincy College, um, they would not necessarily be a degree seeking student. So financial aid wouldn't um, apply in that instance. However, um, to Principal Cahill's point, we do feel as though um, in terms of the registration fee, it is a significant um, reduction, again, with the understanding that that does still provide some challenge for students, um, but also balancing that with the investment that we would be expecting them um, to make. Last year, um, due to COVID, and, and I can speak to this um, a bit, we were, and we always are, looking for any grant opportunities that the college can um, apply for to help absorb any of these costs, particularly um, for low income students. Um, so what we did, were able to do last year was we did receive um, a grant um, from the state that we were able to apply to high school students who were in dual enrollment courses who had received free and reduced lunch. And we use that as a way to determine students who would qualify um, to have the registration fee waived, which again was absorbed by this grant. Um, unfortunately, that grant did end at the end of the last fiscal year, but we do, myself at the college, work closely with our grant writer, and she is well aware of the dual enrollment program and partnerships that we have in place. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I feel confident in saying that we are consistently looking at grant opportunities to support students um, that I described. Um, thanks. So if I could just briefly follow up, um, I just want to um, make sure I'm here understanding a couple of things. So 
I remember in the earlier discussions, I think, I think I'm remembering this correctly, that um, someone had shared the idea of even asking um, the Milton Foundation for Education, whether this would be something that they could potentially help us work with. So it sounds like that conversation hasn't proceeded over the months since we started this discussion. Um, but I, I, if that's the case, I strongly feel that it would be something we would need to explore in order to move forward with this. Because um, I do appreciate the, the point about wanting the students to be bought into taking the course, but I also just want to make sure that we aren't you know, unintentionally implying that a student who can't afford the fee for $300 wouldn't be motivated to work hard in the course, because we know that that's not the case, right? Um, and, you know, I think the idea, as you were saying, Ms. Cassidy, about uh, using, you know, like metrics and um, information we have access to in the college financial aid process, like, that I'm not suggesting that it should just be sort of free for all scholarships, anybody who just says, oh, I want to not have to pay for that. But um, you know, we also, the flip side of that is we, we can't allow a student who, for example, would qualify for the financial aid a year later when applying for college that they are shut out from taking this course uh, because there's no scholarship in place for them. So I, I support dual enrollment strongly as something for us to pursue as a district. And I really appreciate the opportunity to get this additional information. And I also have reservations about moving forward with a specific opportunity, unless we are able tonight here somehow to kind of clarify what the commitment would be to ensure that, um, you know, it wouldn't be leaving any students behind um, just because their family hasn't budgeted to be paying for college credits that, you, you know, or whatever. So anyway, thank you for hearing me out. I'm sorry, I'll stop talking. Um, Betty, do you want to, or, or sorry, I think Member Rustin, your hand was up. I apologize. Thank you for such a thoughtful presentation. I was very pleased with the idea of having a dual enrollment opportunity for our students when it was presented um, late spring, early summer. But um, just adding to Lizzie's point, there was a couple of clarification questions I had. Does every high school partner have an identical contract? So are we all signing the same terms and conditions or do some, do some aspects vary? I can speak to that and thank you. That's an excellent question. So the, um, the um, MOA that we share with all high schools um, is the same. The only differences are um, the courses that are being offered for that district. So the course offerings and all agreements would be for one academic year so that there's the opportunity to revisit, revise, reassess. Um, that was a change that was made um, when I started working more with our dual enrollment programs, um, just to be sure that we were staying relevant and current with all the partners. And given that an MPS teacher is delivering the class, what other services will Quincy College provide for these students? So in terms of services that um, the college would provide is first and foremost, the um, academic leadership. So primarily our academic dean and the faculty who work at the college would, that would be aligned with that particular area. So again, taking math, for example, the dual enrollment high school instructor would have obviously direct contact and collaboration with a faculty member at the college. Um, what we've had other districts do is a lot of times there will be resources, readings, materials that the um, Quincy College faculty member would share with that high school instructor, which would then in turn be shared with the students. And back to um, what I was speaking about earlier in terms of we can be as involved as the high school really wants the college to be is um, we're entertaining this right now or actually working on this right now with Weymouth is we can coordinate um, programs and visits to have um, different student support or faculty and staff visit the actual high school. We have coordinated times where a dual enrollment class or students will come to the campus to kind of get a better sense of what college looks like, what the campus looks like, and those types of things. 
If it's something though where the high school prefers to just give the students the services that they have and keep with that familiarity, that's also an option as well. I don't know if that answers part of the question or if there's anything I can elaborate on, I'm happy to. No, it, it clarifies a very important point for me, which is when Milton Public Schools along with your other part, high school partners are giving a cohort of students to a university and the agreement is, is one such as the services that will be rendered from the university are, um, they're not something that's concrete in our contract. Um, is, is that what is the unit, what is the high school getting beyond very inexpensive credit? Um, I worked for a professional development company that, which was Fitchburg State University and the agreements did vary. And there was some incentives or some um, benefit for this unique partnership because in theory, what um, Mr. Selick had shared, which was extraordinarily smart of him is he's identified a cohort of students that would literally be revenue for Quincy College in all fairness. And if there was some benefit, like, you know, if you get 20 students, you'll get financial aid for three students. But there, ideally, there'd be some reciprocity because beyond getting a transcript, there's not anything written into the contract that says there's a benefit beyond saying we're getting inexpensive credit. And I really do appreciate that because I think he is spot on. The time that took to figure out what would be the ideal course based on what data we have was in my mind brilliant. But I am concerned that there's not an opportunity for flexibility in the agreement to reflect the benefits that Milton will be providing um, for the $330 per credit. I appreciate that. Um, and I think that does, it raises um, you know, a lot of good points. And I, to go back to what we were saying about the agreement, um, yes, they are all currently written the same um, in working with um, Karen and Brian thus far, and, and we haven't really entertained that conversation, but if there was a discussion about adding um, an additional part to the agreement or clearly outlining what those supports would look like or what those services or incentives would look like, um, I would be very comfortable with doing that. It does step away a little bit from dual enrollment, but I can speak confidently that the college um, is becoming more and more every year familiar with what those pathways will look like for high school students, whether it's to Quincy College, whether it's to Bunker Hill, or whether it's to Northeastern. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, we just launched our early college high school program, um, and that's with Quincy Public Schools right now. And it is exactly um, to your point of what services are being extended to these students who are still in high school not only have them earn that credit, but get a better understanding of what does it look like for me to be in that college seat and work with these college instructors. Um, so again, would be more than happy to pull from other programs or other initiatives that we already have in place um, that I, again, would feel confident that we would be able to deliver on. So thank you. Thank you. Dr. Craighead? Was having trouble unmuting. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, I've actually been thinking about this a lot since we had our um, initial meeting on this um, in the spring, I guess it was. Um, and first of all, I'd like to, to thank both uh, Dr. Carroll and um, member Ross Denny for um, um, voicing things that that I was um, getting ready to say, um, especially for uh, the assertion that um, I don't think we want to tie motivation to money. Um, I don't think that's what this should be about, and I don't think it's what it is about um, for the vast majority uh, of students. I think they'd be motivated anyway. Um, growing up, I would have been one of the students looking for some sort of scholarship um, to be able to do this. Um, so um, it's always the first thing that I think about when I look at these kinds of programs. And um, I think that if Quincy isn't going to offer some sort of, um, as member Ross Denny pointed out, some sort of um, 
deal um, where if we provide a certain number of students, there are a certain number of, um, of uh, scholarships that we would get for students who um, who we could figure out who they might be if they if they qualify for free and reduced lunch, et cetera. Um, that we need to do something about that. Um, I had forgotten, Dr. Carroll, that we had been talking about perhaps the MFE, um, but but that is um, certainly something to consider. Um, my other point is that um, is sort of a question. So. What I'm hearing is, is this, is that um, you said that teachers would have access to academic leadership. Um, they would have direct contact with a faculty member at the college who would share materials with them. Um, what though makes this a college level course in Quincy's estimation? What, do teachers have to adhere to some sort of uh, syllabus, guidelines, minimum content? I know that um, uh, Mr. Selig was talking about the fact that we do teach college level courses. Um, that's a great um, statement and I believe it, but I also believe that um, if we're gonna offer a Quincy College course credit to these students, then there needs to be something um, more concrete than sharing materials that, as you said, might be passed along to students. So could you address that more specifically, please? Absolutely, thank you. And uh, Mr. Salek, feel free to, to jump in as well. Um, so when um, we work with a high school, there is a lot of collaboration between the college and the high school instructor leading up to well before the dual enrollment course is actually offered. Um, currently, the dual enrollment courses that we do offer are honors level courses at the high schools. And then it's a matter of working with the high school instructor or instructors um, who would be teaching the course and connecting them with the faculty and academic leadership at the college. What we would do is we share in this example statistics, our statistics, most updated statistics syllabus for the high school to review and to compare to their own curriculum. There's then a back and forth between the high school and the college to ensure that from the college's perspective, the high school syllabus is covering the same content and meeting the same learning outcomes that the high school has in place. So that does in instances require the high school to go back to revise and to make adjustments in order to ensure that it's aligned properly with the Quincy College course no dual enrollment course is put into um, an MOA with the high school partner until it's been reviewed by um, the academic dean and our provost at the college as having that Quincy College, I call it a stamp of approval, which is not the official term, but just making sure that it is something that we are confident is worthy of those three or four credits on the transcript. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and if I may just add as well, um, you know, I think one of the things to me that's really appealing about this unique opportunity with Quincy College is that unlike other dual enrollment programs, and Megan shared sort of the, the, the cost comparison, but other dual enrollment programs that we've looked into, students are required to travel to the campus and receive instruction from a professor at that school. And to me, that's far less appealing than students enrolling in the senior math course that they would be taking at Milton High School, even if they, if, if this conversation never took place, um, where we have um, in partnership with, with uh, Quincy College, but you know, we're not, there's no micromanagement of lesson by lesson what must be taught. It's, it's uh, more collaborative than that and more flexible, quite frankly, than that. Um, so that we're able to deliver the uh, statistic learning experience for our students that um, both adheres to the requirements that Quincy College and their department and advisor agree aligns uh, well enough to earn that quote unquote seal of approval, but within which we still have the flexibility to teach the course as we would and as we have been with or without this partnership. So 
some of the things that I think have been uh, understandably um, elevated as areas of concern are also to me things to consider as areas of potential strength. Um, and most notably that students can opt in at a cost of $300, which I absolutely, I think we're all on the same page. We would never want any of our Milton High School students for that cost to be prohibitive for them to take advantage of this opportunity. And I'm failing to come up with an analogy of other things where uh, there's a cost associated with something and, and, and we have found ways to make sure that that cost is not prohibitive. So I'm, I'm, I'm letting the committee down in that regard. But um, for the cost of $300, students can opt into the opportunity to have the exact same educational experience as they would without opting in and leave with three college credits, which is a little bit hard to quantify the value of, but could potentially for that student um, mean a whole lot more ultimately than the, the cost that went into it. So um, I'm very understanding and appreciative of the uh, concerns that are being raised by the members. And I'm, I'm um, just hoping to also make sure we don't lose sight of what the advantages potentially are as well. So forgive me for that. I'm in the way. So can I ask a little bit, I mean, some of the questions I had earlier have already been addressed, but can I ask a little bit from the scheduling and timing perspective? Are you thinking that you want to do start this in January and the statistics a half a year course or is it a full academic year course? And whether you were thinking that if we could come to an agreement, you would begin this program in January or are you looking at this for next year? I'm glad you brought that question up. So it's a full year course. Um, and so um, I think probably the prudent step is to make sure that we have everything lined up for the students who enroll in this uh, statistics course for fall of 2020, for, for the 2022-23 school year. Okay. Um, if there were no reservations and none of the questions uh, that have been raised, you know, um, couldn't easily be addressed and resolved tonight, I think I could propose uh, seeing if that partnership could be still um, set up for the current students that are enrolled in the course, but I'm not looking at this as a, as a short-term partnership or as a uh, sort of, you know, quick fix by any means of it. I mean, nothing's broken, so there's nothing to quickly fix. Um, but um, I would be very content to spend uh, the rest of this year with this, um, you know, blessing of the committee uh, really kind of hammering out some of these details and making sure that we come into next fall with the um, an accepted uh, curriculum tweaks in place to, to satisfy um, the agreement along with some of the other things that have been uh, appropriately raised as um, questions or concerns. Is that it, Member Waite? Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'd just like to um, say um, to Mr. Sully and Ms. Cassidy that I really appreciate your presentation this evening because it's an actionable step. We hear a lot from the community about the fact that they want to hear more from us about actionable steps, right? About ways that we can actually remove barriers and create opportunities for students and, and eliminate some of those disparities and disproportionalities that exist in our community. And your solution and your thinking drives to that solution, drives to that end goal of creating opportunities. And it's an actionable step that's possible to do. And that's really uplifting and that's really heartening to hear. The committee has a lot of technical and logistical questions about that are, that are important to answer, particularly the one that I'm also most interested in figuring out how we can support students financially, since that is often a big barrier. And I think that in this community that is so able to be creative and generous and in, the, in their time and their money with other causes, they would hop right on this and find ways to create a fund for students to access that. And we could certainly use federal free and reduced lunch, uh, free and reduced lunch um, parameters around how you would qualify and how, how students qualify in the district for other financial aid. So I think that all of those things are possible. And I think that um, it's if 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 the if the if the staff at the high school is ready to think about this moving forward, 
um, for not this academic year. For I do think there are some real genuine concerns that the committee has that they would like to see addressed. But I do really feel that this is an actionable step that we can move forward to create opportunity that the commit that the community has been asking us to do. Uh, after we spent a lot of time last year talking and getting a report and thinking about those things. So I thank my committee who's so smart and thinks so much more than I ever could about things that, in ways that I, 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 I couldn't. And I think that I don't know when you want us to have a vote by, if we could maybe have it at another meeting in this fall to prepare things to go for fall 2022. And if by that time we could think as a committee reaching out to our community partners, how might we create a fund to support students financially that they could access to, to take this course. And additional courses, if we could grow this partnership um, for our district. I just want to share quickly that it sounds like um, Ms. Cassidy does have some options, so it doesn't always have to be the Milton community raising money. We could come up with those incentive programs, but at the end of the day, I think there's a general idea here that we're all supportive of dual enrollment. I think we just need to work on the terms of the MOU, and I'm have I don't know if this ends up being a subcommittee. I know as as chair, you might have the technical understanding of what how do we proceed. But I think if we put our heads together, this is something that can be done quickly. Um, I don't think we're far off from where we need to be. We just need to put our heads together about what makes the most sense. So if, the, if our next steps are to um, go into um, going into the agreement as a small committee or with the town's attorney or the district, whatever it is, I'm happy to be part of that in any way that I can to make this happen. Yeah, yeah I and think thank you um, for your work. Yeah, I think uh, Member Rostini, that's a perfect. We don't even have to like. We could just have two, um, or one or two sub uh, school committee members work with um, Quincy and the district and the lawyers to figure that piece out and then present it at a meeting for a final vote. Um, and, and understanding the timeline for fall 2022 would be really helpful, so that you know by this date we need to have a decision made so that we can move forward for next year. Yeah, um, I think that would be helpful um, in terms of that. And, and I might, if I may speak, to, I'm sorry to, to cut you off. Um, a timeline for, for next year makes a lot of sense and I think should coincide with when um, we're making proposed changes to the program of studies for um, the 2022, pardon me, seems crazy to even say, 22-23 school year, um, because then this could be something that could be included in the course description for honor statistics and, and students might potentially even um, weigh it in consideration of what the course that they select for their senior math, um, uh, you know, could, could factor into that decision. So I just wanted to be sure to um, add that in. Brian, and Brian, thank you for saying that. That was something I was going to say as well. Starting this later this fall, we will start revising the program studies for the 22-23 school year. It's hard to say that out loud. Um, and my apologies for um, not knowing about the MFE as a possibility. I know there was, I, my understanding was there were sub subsequent conversations after my first presentation, um, and that might not have been something that was brought to my attention, but I am more than happy to work with MFE or other organizations in the community, along with Quincy College, for potential grants on their end to see how we can um, support any, any student who wants to pursue this. Um, and I'm happy to work, again, as Member Rust, and he said, off camera or subgroups or whatever is the correct thing to do um, to get this program up and running. Because I, I do believe this is something, I know when Superintendent Jet was Principal Jet, um, we had these conversations. And, and I really think this is a great opportunity for any of our students um, to get that, that early college piece of it and let them see that they can succeed at the college level um, and find that success and feel good about themselves and what the future holds for them. So I do appreciate, truly appreciate this opportunity that you all took this evening to do this for us um, and look forward to working with you. However, that is, and you can explain that to us to, to make this happen for our students. So thank you very much for that time this evening. Oh, thank you, Ms. Kale and Ms. Mr. Selig and Ms. Cassidy. And I think, so I think the action steps here is, as Member Rostin, he said to move forward, how do we, how do we make the MOA work, MOU work? And then also the timeline. So by December, we are going to decide that this is going to be, these will be the parameters, and then we can make a vote as a committee to move forward with that. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you, Principal Cahill, uh, Brian Selick, and uh, Megan Cassidy. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. 
Thank you. You're more than welcome to stay for the rest of the school <laughs> committee if you like. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you Appreciate all it. very much. Much appreciated. It was great talking with all of you, and thank you again. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is the DESI, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education end of the year report. It was submitted to the school committee uh, for a vote. Um, so I throw it to you, uh, Chair Eberhardt. I hope you all had an opportunity to take a read. You mean all, I don't even remember how many pages the whole thing is. Um, it's a very long document. Um, and it is the, it basically, it's the, the district runs the financials and all the different programs they have, and they um, collect them into this final end of the year report. And it's submitted to DESE um, from, by us from the district. Um, I don't think, let me just go back to the uh, Charlene's email here. I don't think there's a way to uh, share the um, report on the screen. Did anyone, while I'm thinking about that, have any questions about the report that she sent? Where is it? Um, and I also be a. I also believe a copy is usually submitted to the town, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it is submitted. For review. Yeah, sorry, here it is. Yes, a copy is submitted um, to the um, town for review, and it has multiple tabs in the, well, I can show people what it looks like if people are interested, hold on. Uh, I think that this is it, I could be wrong. Hold on one second, did anyone, oh yeah, I can go back, but technology. Um, so the report looks, this is one of the, there's a comment page um, that's on the first page. This is the end of year, fiscal year 21, end of year financial report. And as you go down, it goes down by different categories, revenue from local sources, from the state aid, from grants, revolving funds, and then it gives the totals here in the final column of the year. all the way down, superintendent, assistant superintendents, district administration, business and finance, human resources, legal services, school committee. Yep, there's a number right there. Um, contracted legal settlements, curriculum director. So it goes through salary, legal, con legal um, costs, and then it goes through um, line by line by line. I'm sure Dr. Craighead is so excited to see all these things. Um, um, Assistant Superintendent Dexter, would you like to say something? Yeah, so the only thing I wanted to add is um, that this not only takes the actual financial, financial um, expenditures and revenues for um, the school, but it also, we reach out to the finance director at the town who reaches out to each of the individual departments on the town side, and they report to us um, a, an estimated cost of what they, how they supported the school. So for instance, when I was the town accountant, I would allocate a portion of my time and my staff's time because we process payments on behalf of the schools for their payroll and vendor, things like that. So that's why on some of these pages, you're seeing two different columns, one that more closely mirrors the school budget. And then the other um, column is costs that are on the town side that support the school budget. So a big one on that is like group health insurance that's allocated to school employees. So it's the combination of those two things that get us to this report. And at the end of the day, DESE will use this information to calculate the nets, um, I don't know how the actual terminology, but the cost per pupil, that kind of thing, to make sure we're meeting the minimum required spending on education, which we far exceed the minimum. So um, that's kind of the, a general commentary on what this report does and how it brings everything together. Um, so Assistant Superintendent Dexter, that was a question that someone asked us at town meeting. Um, 
back in the springtime about cost per pupil. And so mm -hmm. it's, it, that's information that's helpful tonight to understand that that cost per pupil might also include the, um, the time cost from a town, um, from the town employee um, factored into the total cost to run the district. Um, yeah, there yeah. might be two different yeah. calculations. Okay. I can stop sharing my screen now. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions about the end of the year report for DESE? Anyone, oh, Dr. Craighead, and then member Rosemary. Um, I don't have any questions, but um, I did uh, look carefully at this report and I would just like to um, thank and commend um, Assistant Superintendent Dexter and those who worked with her um, on it for the amount of time and effort uh, that it takes to do this kind of mandated state reporting. So thank you. Thank you. Member Rosemarin? That was exactly what I was going to say. So <laughs> I just want to thank thank uh, Assistant Superintendent Dexter for her first annual report um, and her role and um, congratulate you. <laughs> Thank so you. can I just make a comment on those two comments? Um, <laughs> I don't want to take credit where it's not deserved, but thank you. But um, huge shout out to Lisa McDonough, who's the budget analyst at the, the school department. Um, she's like a right-hand man to me, right-hand person to me, and she is right on it and she's fabulous at what she does and she pulls this all together and we review it together. So as much as I'd love to take all the credit, the credit really goes to Lisa. Um, and I'm gonna say this publicly, she's one of the many reasons why I wanted to come over to the school side because I knew how great she was and how much support I would have in the business office along with um, Maureen, Karen, and um, Gail, who also support me in that side. So I just want to send them all a thank you and give that that credit to them where it's due. Um, so, but thank you. They're great. So, Well, thank you, Assistant Superintendent Dexter. So if there are, no one has any more comments or um, questions, we have to, um, there's a motion to accept the DESE end of year report um, for fiscal year, I believe it was 21, is that what it said? Um, for the Milton Public Schools. Second. So moved. So moved, thank you. All right, this will be a roll call vote. A member Rosemarin? Yes. Dr. Craighead? Yes. Dr. Carroll? Yes. Member Rostini? Yes. Member White? Yes. And member Eberhardt, yes. Six zero, thank you so much. Thank you for all the work that went into that. It's a ton of work. And thank you, Dr. Craighead, for looking it over with your fine financial eyes there. <laughs> all right, the next, the next thing up is the district updates from the superintendent. As superintendent, you have to unmute yourself, sorry. Sorry. It's okay. 20 months and we're still doing this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, thank you, uh, Chair Eberhardt. Uh, I do, I'm very excited to report that we got some great news uh, today on two major fronts. The first is the transportation. As many people know, uh, we made a couple of different announcements that we se secured the finances to have an additional bus to support our uh, students that are way out in East Milton Square across the highway, that, uh, particularly in the middle and high school that didn't have the transportation to get there. Today, uh, Amy uh, Dexter, Laurie Dunn, uh, working with first student, they secured a bus driver. Uh, so we hope that that will start and get pick up a vast majority of the students in the uh, middle and high school from East Milton Square starting on Tuesday, October 12th. Uh, and the reason why we say in Tuesday, October 12th, we now have to work with the bus company. Amy's going to be taking a ride with the new bus driver to try to determine the time stops and pickups. So we'll be working on that. So I'm asking people, if you know someone that was on that waiting list, please pay attention to their email this weekend. I know it's a holiday weekend coming up, but in preparation for Tuesday morning pickup, we want to make sure that they're fully aware of what's going on. Uh, and we'll do our best to uh, send a, an, an email to those on a waiting list and hopefully a phone alert to those on the waiting list as well to make sure that they uh, get the information that they need. And the phone alert might just direct them to their email. Um, so I just wanted to give uh, folks that information. Now, 
as you know, we do have limitations on the bus. It's less than 50 on a bus, uh, approximately about 46 for middle and high school, somewhere in that range, just because of the body composition. Whereas the elementary folks, we can fit up to uh, 73 on a bus, three to a bench. Uh, so we hope to get as many students as we can. But as always, if your child's uh, transportation needs have changed on any of the bus routes and you're able to uh, avail that seat to someone else, please let us know and we'll be happy to reimburse you, but also put folks on the bus that absolutely need it. So that will be going home in the, in the blog tomorrow. And then we'll be looking at an individual email to those on the waiting list. And I didn't know if anybody had any questions, but I'm, uh, I'm very excited, uh, even though we were trying to reach out to Desi to see how Chelsea and other districts got the National Guard to secure uh, drivers for the bus. Uh, for those who didn't know, there's a shortage across the Commonwealth, not only with bus drivers, but with a lot of different uh, businesses. Um, and so we are very appreciative of all the efforts on uh, MPS part but also on first student's part. And I don't know if uh, any of the school committee members have any questions. Looks like Dr. Craighead has her hand up. <laughs> I don't have questions, but I do have comments. Um, first of all, um, this time, uh, Assistant Superintendent Dexter, you can't just pass along all the <laughs> Um, you and Laurie Dunn have worked your tails off to, to get this, to to get transportation to happen in the district period. Um, and so I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I also want to thank the families who have been so patiently waiting for this to happen. Um, the efforts have been made, uh, believe me, I know I heard about it on a weekly basis about what was going on. Um, about driver certification and tests and licenses out of state and all sorts of stuff. And uh, given the, um, the shortage that we've all heard about about bus drivers, this is really, really uh, good news. So um, thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. And I know we'll think about, I know those conversations, Dr. Craighead, are probably happening now in, in finance about what buses look like for, as um, we said, 22, 23. Um, but I really appreciate all the extra effort that we made and the creative financing of the bus it was really, I know it's, a, you know, 23 days into the school year, but it's 20, it, that doesn't matter. We still have lots, we, it does matter, but we still have a lot of more days to go. And this is really helpful to family. So thank you, thank you, thank you for the extra effort that was made, appreciated. So another good uh, news story in, it also comes on the heels of a delay, is the uh, Milton Public Schools testing program. Uh, for those who don't uh, know, uh, there's a, test, a state testing program that was offered to many diff all districts throughout the Commonwealth. Over 2,000 schools uh, selected it and participated in it. If you didn't hear the webinars or saw the media coverage on Fox or NBC last week, uh, the, the uh, DESI was very, optimistic in this or overly optimistic and they fell short of some of the uh, contracts that they needed, but they've been working feverishly to try to uh, fill in the slots to provide the staff and support to the schools that want to do the testing. We are pleased to say that our nurse started today. Now, when I say started today, we had to do some onboarding. So I want folks to know uh, onboarding and training. She worked with Kim Kaufman all day today getting a lay of the land, looking at our testing kits, looking at the protocols that we set up. We hope that the test and stay, well, not hope, we anticipate the test and stay will start Tuesday, October 12th. That seems like a, uh, a pretty uh, popular day right now. Um, what are the things that I do wanna take this opportunity uh, to say to parents? We need parents in order to participate in a test and stay, we need parental or guardian consent. We cannot test students in the test and stay without your consent. There are three programs under the state. Symptomatic testing, which I'll talk about in a second, test and stay, and then pooled testing, P-O-O-L-E-D, pooled testing. That is kind of the surveillance test. And some people thought it was four testing programs. It's pool testing. One is school follow-up and one is lab follow-up. They're the same thing. It's just who's doing the follow up on that. We have engaged in the first two with the option of going into 
the third, the pool testing. But as you can imagine, with 4,400 students and we're doing surveillance testing, we're going to need some support. So the CIC said that they are willing to support the district, but they have to get some of these test and stay programs off the ground before we can secure that nurse. And I put, a, I put uh, information out there in the beginning for the 60%. The 60% was for us to even have that, the value of doing pool testing at the minimum 60%. Ideally, I would love to have 100%, but that's what we need for a minimum. But because we had one central consent form, one unified universal consent form, it was given to us by the state, not by the school, by the state. That's what we were uh, talking about. So I tried to clarify that in, in one of the blogs. I hope people uh, got that. If you anticipate, and we hope that you do, sign your student, your child up to give us consent to do the test and stay, just so you know, if they do the test and stay and they're close contact, if they're negative, they remain in school. They remain in school. And so far, so far this school year, as of last uh, Friday, or I should say Saturday or Sunday, because we had a few things percolate over the weekend, but as of last, uh, this past Saturday, we've had uh, 35 positive cases. Uh, five of them were staff, 30 of them were student, and out of the 150 plus uh, close contacts, we only had two of the close contacts uh, test positive. So for those students that had to stay home, had we had to test and stay, they could have possibly never missed a day of school if they test negative. So that's why I think it's imperative for as many parents as possible to sign on and give us the consent, at least for the test and stay and symptomatic uh, symptomatic uh, testing. So today, Kim Coughlin, the director of nurses for the Milton Public Schools, along with our CIC nurse that came on staff, they're working out the logistics. How do we do it? Where do we set it up at each school? We had our plans in place. We talked about it yesterday with principals trying to uh, hammer that out. Uh, but uh, we still have a few more de details to work out now that this person's on board. But we anticipate that this will start on Tuesday, uh, October 13th. So, and I don't know if folks have any questions about the test and stay, asymptomatic, or the protocol or the policies. Does anyone have any questions for Superintendent Chet about the COVID policies? Member, anyone? I don't have a question, but I have a comment. This is such a relief for so many families who have suffered from allergies and have kept their children home. So thank you for getting it up and running. I know it wasn't in the timeline. We all anticipated, but better late than never. So thank you. Yeah, and I know this past week has been, I know having to, um, wait until now has been challenging because, you know, over the past week or so, if you had the test um, in place with the close contacts, the two, it would have been easier to um, make sure that people, would some of those people could have come back to school um, that didn't test positive, but you had to keep them out. So I really appreciate that um, so much. Dr. Carroll, I apologize. I didn't see your hand. That's okay. Um, my question is just about the, the number of people who have thus far, um, you know, signed on or given their approval for their student to participate in the testing. Um, so it's it's like two question, two part question. Um, I'm wondering, I know that the 60% threshold is really a make or break threshold. I mean, my understanding, if or when we were to decide to add pool testing on. But uh, my question is on that piece, like how close are we to 60% at this point in time? Um, and do we have that update? And related to that, um, is there some, I know I anticipate you'll, you, you said you'd put this in the blog tomorrow. So that's great. So people will have the update and be able to, um, you know, if they haven't given their approval yet, that they could do it through the blog. But can we also do something like text alert the families that have not yet given their approval or something, because I just, I know that we need to give people different ways to receive the information when it's this important. And if there could just be a way to say, test and stay begins Tuesday, but you have not yet given your approval, want to make sure that you have the opportunity to do that. I don't know, just, or, or a phone thing, like you were saying about the transportation, a phone message that says like, please read the blog and follow the link. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it seems just like an important 
thing to make sure. I know I, I've spoken with people who are not opposed to it. They just have an inbox that's out of control. They don't always keep up with the blog because I can relate to that. So um, just want to make sure everybody can stay up with it. So very good question. We talked about the numbers. We looked at Pierce. Our, right now at Pierce, you got 268 sixth graders that are not age eligible to, to uh, get the vaccine. But as far as the pool testing, uh, we do have the numbers. I don't have them in front of me. Kim was working on that in updating that system today. And unfortunately, I've been kind of caught up and I drove all the way home, didn't have my computer charger and drove all the way back to get back, back on it. So I don't I don't have that information uh, with me handily, but hopefully uh, as part of the letter in the blog, and I get what you're saying about texting people, the difference with the waiting list, we're talking about 50 something people. In terms of consent, we could be talking about thousands of something people. So the it's a little harder and a little more complicated to go in and do the manual selecting of who, because then we got to go to Kim Coughlin to see, or the individual building nurses, and then they got to give us the names, and then we got to go in and select it. So what we could do is do a universal alert, whether it be about trans a phone alert about uh, the consent forms and the transportation, but I was only going to send it to the 50, the phone alert to the 50 people about transportation. For those who don't need transportation or already have it, having that another uh, email, as you just alluded to, people's inboxes are overwhelmed. But we're figuring it out and we get that information out. And I would encourage anybody that's on here now that utilize any of the social media platforms. I know a lot of people communicate on the social media platform. You can let them I'm asking for their cooperation in that in that sense to put it on there that the test and stay is starting next week in order for students to participate in the test and stay. Uh, they have to give consent to test. If not, and they don't give consent to test, they do have to go home and quarantine if they're close contact. So I, I if I could just intercede for one second, I think Dr. Carroll's point, I remember um, former chair, um, Sheila Varela talking a lot about how the texts work better than anything um, in terms of like contacting generations of, of people. So I know that what you're saying, Superintendent Jed, is I think a universal, if you've done it, great. I know that it sometimes generates people to wonder, did they actually do it? Um, but I do think that the more- I would talk to Bob Patterson uh, yeah. first thing in the morning. Say, I personally, in my role, I have never used the system to text and I don't know how that works. But if, if it's a possibility, I can assure you that will go out, if not simultaneously with the blog, it'll go out after the blog or whatever to refer people to the blog. I would definitely explore that. Okay, great. Uh, Member White, did you have something you wanted to say? Um, I just was, gonna, uh, people are asking about the pool testing in my neighborhood when I'm out walking. Um, and I'm just wondering, can you talk a little bit about how that would, how that would be um, financed because I think that is a pretty significant expense to do pool testing in the schools. So, and I'm glad you brought that up and I would be remiss if I didn't say this. So the nurse that we're getting is paid for by CIC Health. The Binex Now testing we're using for the test and state is going to be financed by uh, CIC Health. And same thing with every aspect of the testing, the fee is associated with CIC Health or the state. The state is sponsoring that. So they pay for the salary of the nurse along with the benefits, um, which we're very appreciative of. Uh, and they pay for all of the materials and supplies. Now, obviously, there are going to be some supplies that we have to provide as a district in terms of PPEs for those who are administering this test and stay. But I think it's a small cost to the district for a greater gain, uh, mm -hmm. for a greater gain. Thanks. Great question, though. Did anyone else have any other questions about COVID updates or testing staying and no? Great. Anything else, Superintendent Chet? Yes, the last thing I wanted to share with people is that it's been a busy first few weeks of the academic year. In addition to open houses and welcoming our new students to the various different buildings, we also spent time uh, this past week and last week, the beginning of this week and last week, when well, I'm saying the beginning, we're still in the middle, but last week, we met with uh, our leadership team on Thursday, looking at uh, data, not only uh, data from um, this spring's MCAS, 
but uh, looking at data from a, a, a cohort of 2017, 18, and 19, and trying to identify different analysis and walking through a, a, a data protocol and making uh, predictions, uh, observations, and assumptions, and then trying to talk about the next steps. Then we also met with individual principals, um, you know, with Brian Selig as the math department head, along with Kat DeRoche as the uh, literacy coordinator and uh, Allison McHugh at the high school, who is the English um, English department head, along with individual principals, vice principals, and any other support team. Tucker, you had Ramsey Cadet, the adjustment council, which I was very pleased and surprised that the adjustment council jumped in and wanted to see the data. We have a plan to meet in the afternoon on our professional development day on November 2nd to now work in department to make sure that the teachers have an opportunity to follow that same protocol and let them see the data, put the data in their hands so they can identify and then we all calibrating on what we determine what the next steps will be. I know there's a lot of conversations about what, what we want to do. Obviously, we want to incorporate tier one uh, supports, tier one supports to the core instructions to make sure that we're, we're funneling uh, what differentiated instruction within the classroom during the school day. And then from there, if the, some students are still not making gains, if a lot of people heard about the, the accelerated uh, expectation from the state saying, make sure that you're teaching students grade level work, but also scaffolding support. For those students who are still struggling, then we look at tier two supports. Well, how, do, how do we uh, provide additional supports for some of those targeted areas in which they're falling short? In order to do that, we need to know specifically where these students are in triangulating the data between the iReady, the Core 5, and the MCAS data that we did get. Um, I think when we emailed that executive summary to families, I know for some families it was an eyebrow raiser, as it was for me, I'm making no excuses. And even though the executive summary said we did better than the state, we know that across the state that there were shortfalls. Uh, and I don't want to say that all of them are due to the pandemic because we had some students who did some of our uh, learning platforms who, who performed very well. There wasn't a change. So we can't make the assumption those who went remote had a negative experience, and we can't make the assumption that those who came in a hybrid had a positive experience. It's a mixed bag on both accounts, and it's, it's up to us in addition to identifying those academic needs, I think I said it before and it came out clear on some of our meetings over the course of the week, also making sure we support our students socially, emotionally, uh, because if they're not well or not able to focus, anxiety, uh, concerns about the academics and stresses that were developed over the course of the pandemic is going to make it very difficult to them to focus to the top the, the, the best ability within the classroom. So how do we scaffold and supports in there? And we talked about it, uh, and I'm assuming you guys are gonna talk a little bit about the goals, but talking about different supports. Last spring, we incorporated the reading specialists uh, to try to work with students. Our goal is to make sure every student is reading at grade level uh, by third grade. Um, and you know, when you think about it, every test is a reading test first. We wanna make sure that we support students so they know exactly what they're doing on every assessment that they take. Um, so I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot. And then many of you as parents or guardians who are on here, some of you as school committee members who have children, you were, uh, my hope is you enjoyed the uh, back to school nights, uh, back to school nights. I used to stop calling it open house because I used to get people from out of, different communities. They thought it was an open house where they come in and see and they could come to, to Milton Public School. So we called it back to school night. Um, so I use that, those uh, terms interchangeably, but I, I hope everybody had a great experience. And then my, my last comment is make sure that you at home are monitoring your students' progress. If you see frustration, you see concerns, you see the uh, your child uh, burning the midnight candle, it's incumbent upon you to reach out, whether it be to a guidance counselor, the principal, uh, the, the adjustment counselor, let someone know uh, because we want to support you on that. And we we have no way of knowing what's going on at home unless the student tells us or the parent or guardian shares that information with us. Thank you, Superintendent Jett. Would anyone on the committee like to ask Superintendent Jett any questions about his update here on MCAS? Um, wonderings about um, future... Um, um, future... Um, um, future meetings when we'll have more discussion about that. Anyone? Yes, no? 
Um, Superintendent Jett, I know that um, VIVU usually comes to our school committee meeting and does a, a presentation on the data in a much more um, detailed manner. Do we have any sense of when that presentation might happen this year? Uh, my hope and expectation it will be in November, uh, which is very similar. And you know, hopefully by then we'll have a lot more SAT data, AP data, along with uh, MCAS, but also it gives our, our faculty and staff to really dissect it. And then we could talk about what those major interventions or tier two, tier three supports that we need to incorporate uh, in there. But we are working, um, I would say as a, a former principal, in terms of putting this data in the hands of not only the leadership team, but also uh, in the hands of individual principals in, uh, in their team and drilling it down by school. This is probably one of the first times that we've done it like that and done it within the first, pretty much the first month of school, a little bit after that. But we had a couple of uh, days off, the 3rd, the 6th, and the 16th, but um, definitely moving forward with a lot of that work. And, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't give kudos to uh, Janet Sheehan. Janet Sheehan, obviously, for th those who don't know, she's on the screen right now as the interim uh, interim uh, superintendent that came aboard. Uh, I did read a little bit of a bio last week, but Janet Sheehan came in hitting the ground running. She took the time in her first week to set out, carve out time to meet with every department head, curriculum coordinator. She ran the pr uh, principal uh, in elementary principal and uh, coordinators meeting to talk about uh, some of these things and then working with the principals and talking to the principals yesterday in our leadership meeting about the school improvement plans. So I think there's a lot of things that are happening uh, and goes back to a couple of people's comments on the uh, listening session earlier about letting the, the community know what's happening. It is, the train is moving. Um, and I just think that we need to do a better job of communicating that to the public so they can see that there's, there's progress uh, happening. Just want to say thank you, Superintendent Jeff. I, I appreciate that. Oh, no problem. Nice to be here. I feel terrible. I'm just used to seeing you. And here you are. <laughs> and then you came back. But this is your first meeting. And I am a terrible chair. And I am so sorry. No, it's <laughs> no, my gosh. Like when Mr. Superintendent Jet um, you know, like um just said that I was like, oh my God, this is her first meeting, and we didn't say anything. Yep. F. You didn't need to. I just, I just have now. I have an opportunity to thank all of you for your support of my appointment. So thank um, you. For that. Remember that I grade it's my day. To be F. Back. <laughs> a total thank F. You. Sorry about that. I am so sorry. No, so th thank no you apologies for, for, for um, for um, for all the updates. And I hope everyone enjoyed the back to school nights. Um, I do miss those days. Um, although they're crazy and hectic when you go, but they are wonderful opportunities to learn more about the community. So. Um, thank you so much. All right, so we're going to move on. Next item is citizen speak, although I know that um, Member Rosemarin has a question for the committee. Um, yes, I'm sorry I didn't ask about this in the beginning of the meeting, but I'm just wondering if um, perhaps after citizen speak, um, we might move the school building committee report up. We have our guest, um, Sean O'Rourke here, and Principal Bill Fish who are waiting in the wings um, to present, and I just hate to make them wait till um, too much later. You took the words right out of my mouth. So that's that's a great idea. Um, if I had could have just like a show of your hand like this, if that's okay with you. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Um, you. All right, so we'll have an opportunity for Citizen Speak, um, which will be next on our agenda. So I will remind everyone that Citizen Speak is an opportunity for citizens to address any concerns or any um, happy uh, happenings, happy happenings that have been happening or questions to the committee, we do not respond. Um, we limit citizen speak to 15 minutes. Um, everyone, ha you have about three minutes to speak. Um, if you want to speak, you can raise your hand and someone will, um, will promote you to speak. We ask that you um, state your name and your address and that you um, limit your comments to things that the school committee can address and also that you do not refer to any specific individual or person at this time. So we can start citizen speak. Um, if anyone would like to speak, you can raise your hand and I, I'm hoping that um, Milton Access TV will be here to um, promote someone or maybe assistant superintendent Dexter who's now becoming an expert in this can do that as well, do that, I don't know. I can, I'd be happy to do that. Um, right now, uh, there's nobody raising their hand, but if anybody would like to speak for Citizen Speak, please raise your hand so that you can be recognized.
Would anybody like to speak for Citizen Speak? Please raise your hand so you can be recognized. I see nobody um, is raising their hand. Oh, I'm on mute. Okay, thank you very much, Assistant Superintendent Dexter. With that, um, and please feel free to email us. Um, we'll we happily um, try to respond to any of your questions through an email and and save them for future uh, responses at Assistant Speak uh, at Assistant Speak response. With no further ado, uh, Member Rosemarin and Member White, School Building Committee update is next on the agenda. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, our visitors who are joining us tonight. Sean O'Rourke, who's the chair of the School Building Committee, and uh, Principal Bill Fish have uh, joined us this evening to take part in this uh, discussion. And I will turn it over to uh, Sean to take it from here. Thanks, Ada. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, yeah, I just want to kind of give an update. I know we met previously in the spring and I kind of gave an update uh, for us as what we were doing as a school building committee, it was a little more introductory. Uh, but tonight I kind of want to fill you in on kind of the progress, which has been a lot uh, since that last meeting. So if I could, I'm just going to share my screen and bring you right into the presentation. Perfect. So for, for those that aren't familiar, our committee is made up of nine members. Uh, the five at the top, uh, including myself, were appointed by the town moderator. Uh, Ader and Betty uh, represent the school committee on the bottom left, and Mike Zulis and Glenn Hoffman uh, represent the select board. Uh, so the nine of us have kind of been working since the spring of 2019 uh, on the planning and the construction uh, of a new school. Um, so the one thing that's been driving the school that everybody is aware of is kind of our enrollment data and what we've been doing with that. So. We were patiently waiting over the summer for the updated enrollment numbers. And what I've done here is, is a graphical representation of them, which is kind of opposite of the way it's typically portrayed, I think. So typically the school years go across the X axis on the bottom with enrollment numbers across the Y on the top. So I kind of flipped it around. For me, it just speaks a little easier. So on the left side, what you see there going from the bottom at 2007 to 2008, up to the current is the enrollment years that you have there. And as you go across the screen, you see a kind of a breakdown of each grade level from pre-K in blue all the way over to the dark blue, which is grade five. Um, also on the graph, as you can see, the yellow line that you see there is essentially the building capacity that we've talked about, you know, as kind of in our baseline as, as, a, as a measuring tape. Um, as you can see, you know, right after the schools were open, they kind of exceeded that capacity fairly quickly. And pre-pandemic, the growth of the enrollment has always been about 2% when you average it out, compounded. Um, last year, obviously, enrollment went down. And that's why for us, we wanted to kind of see, was it going to continue going down uh, as we talked about in the spring, or was it going to spike back up? And obviously, it, it's kind of leading back up to pre-pandemic levels. So. The idea from what last time we talked with NESDEC, having a negative projection on our enrollments kind of, again, didn't prove true. So the architecture of the district right now, as everyone's aware, and for those on the phone that might not be aware, we have five elementary schools that are a mix of kindergarten and pre-kindergarten to fifth grade. Uh, they all feed up to the Pierce Middle School that Mr. Fish represents, and it's grade six, seven, and eight, and then that all feeds up into the high school. Our committee, along with the school committee previously, had voted to kind of construct a new elementary school. And that's kind of the charge that we were running with uh, for a while. But as we started digging into it, there were a couple of things that started bubbling to the top as, you know, we started really digesting this. First is we'd be building a fifth elementary school to feed into a singular middle school. And, you know, from listening in on some of your committee presentations, I actually listened to it at times, um, I've heard of the enrollment crunch or the, or the space crunch also occurring in the middle school. So that kind of, you know, got our committee thinking, like, is this the right school we should build? The other part that comes up too is we'd be building a fifth brand new elementary school with four existing schools. 
So parity between the, the five schools at that point is another thing that we'd have to address. So what would we do at Tucker, Glover, Cunningham, and Collicott to kind of raise them to the level of a brand new elementary school? And then the, the third thing that's probably the biggest thing that I, a lot of people have a hard appetite for would be this needs to, this school would cause us to redistrict all the elementary schools. So as we started thinking about it, there were a couple ideas tossed around. And, you know, the graph is, that I bring up here, the one thing that jumped out at me originally was fifth grade started eclipsing that, um, that line that we had there for capacity right around 2015, 2016. So for me, simply, uh, my idea was, hey, if there's room at the middle school, let's just push the fifth grade up there. We don't have to build a new school. It kind of buys us some time. But obviously, I, once I started hearing the, the crunch in the middle school, like that wasn't a possibility. So our committee's basically looking at right now is if we take the fifth grade in the preschool and look at moving them out, what would that do? So right now, what, what we're proposing and what we want some feedback from you tonight is what we'd like to do is take all the elementary schools as is and keep them kindergarten to fourth grade. The preschool would move up to a new middle school and the fifth grade would be moved up to the Pierce Middle School. So Pierce Middle School would basically become a fifth and sixth grade school. The new school that we're planning on building at the new site, which we'll talk about in a little bit, would be a seventh and eighth grade school and also house, for lack of a better word, a pre-K wing onto it. And that would all be housed at a, what I'm calling an educational campus when we talk about the land and you might be aware of it uh, at the high school. So for us, you know, we go back and we look at this and for me, the data is, okay, let's strip out these numbers and see what the enrollment looks like. They all drop way below um, the numbers, that 1900 capacity that we've been talking about. So graphically, yes, it looks good. Does that work? Um, so what we started doing is looking at classroom conversions. So as everyone knows, this year in the Collicott Cunningham Library, there were additional spaces on the bottom side of this uh, for a classroom and teacher room that were made. The bottom left that you see here is currently a classroom in the Collicott Cunningham. And in the bottom right is essentially a teacher's room that's there. And again, it doesn't really lend itself for a professional teacher to like have that type of space if you look at the size of the desks. Further, you know, previously in the upper left-hand uh, corner of the image and on the bottom right-hand corner of the uh, picture, um, that's a, kind of a computer lab that got kind of squeezed in because the computer space on the bottom floor of Colin Todd Cunningham kind of got moved up there. In the bottom left hand, you kind of see the library squished in now because all these spaces bookending it. And this is kind of indicative across the entire district. I'm just using this as, you know, as a, as a picture for those that might not be aware. So essentially all your internal spaces inside the building have been cannibalized. That's kind of the term everybody's been using for it. You're out of space and we've got a long way to go before this building, our new elementary school gets built or middle school. Uh, so what that's going to mean is over the next three to four years, modular classrooms are going to have to happen. And what that is, it's a cannibalism of exterior space, parking lots, playgrounds, all that space that's outside, or we'll have to find additional space to kind of fit these in. So back to, you know, if we move pre-K out and we move fifth grade out, what does that do after we do this project? And what I wanted to do is kind of use this as a metric to show you what the potential of doing this. So at the Collicott, if we move fifth grade out, we gain five classrooms. At the Glover, it would be four classrooms, neither of which have preschool in them. Cunningham, you would gain four classrooms and five pre-K classrooms currently. Tucker, it would be an additional three classrooms and three pre-K classrooms. So in total, We'd open up 16 classrooms for grade five by moving them up and eight preschool classrooms, which are essentially the bigger ones. Uh, preschool classrooms are larger and have their own bathrooms. Well, not all eight are exactly that. That's kind of the metric we've been using. What this does is allow the converted rooms that over the years for art and music and everything that have been converted to classrooms to come back to their original state. 
So the key thing with this is how does this measure against the DRA study that was done in 2018? So that was kind of the, the, the goal when we were doing this whole project, how, how we can meet those goals. And after I did the numbers, I brought it back to this and looked and surprisingly we hit all the numbers. So for the 16 classrooms that were, was our shortfall, we addressed that by moving the fifth grade up. The four additional kindergarten classrooms, well, we have eight preschool classrooms. So we'd hit that four with four additional preschool classrooms left over that could kind of fill the need of those special ed spaces and art and music. The other key thing that's on here is the classrooms, the 16 classrooms that were there were planned on grades one through five. And as we just said, we'd be moving five up. So we'd actually have an excess, that 16 shortfall that's listed there in red would actually be down maybe one or two classrooms. So this opens up, a, this idea kind of opens up a lot of classrooms and addresses the needs of, at the elementary school very well. The other part that comes in too, as I mentioned, this opens up, this also addresses the middle school because by creating a new middle school, it kind of frees up some of that space that Bill can talk about in a minute. Um, but what we do is we create a campus now at the high school. So those of you that aren't aware, you know, our current plan right now is we've targeted land at the high school adjacent to the football field. It's currently zoned as conservation land and that's the parcel shown in blue. Um, we're working with town council to kind of rectify some land swap that wasn't properly recorded. And then once that's done, our goal is to present a land swap to the town for a vote that would basically reflect this after the vote. So the Northern part of Guile Road that was not conservation land would become conservation land. And then the Southern parcel that used to be conservation land would now be our new parcel for a school. And you know, with our intent of it being a middle school right now. And with that, that's, you know, as we're talking about it as a committee, this is where I'm talking about it as like an educational campus, because now you'd have a seventh and eighth grade along with the high school sharing fields, sharing transportation, different things like that. Uh, where we are in this process right now, very conceptual. We have not even put pen to paper for what the floor plans will look like. We've engaged DRA architects, which some of you might be aware did the last school building project. And what we've asked them to do is provide us conceptual layouts of what a middle school will look like and also what an elementary school would look like. And then, you know, once we get that stuff done and we work with MSBA, you know, we'll go into design, which then will lead into construction, and then hopefully open a, you know, a brand new school at the site, which was kind of represented on the bottom. The other part of this that came in, you know, an initial concern of us is, you know, we talked about an elementary school and is a middle school more expensive than an elementary school? So the, again, the good thing is MSBA publishes all their data. So what we tried to do is find localized projects that are kind of, for the term I use, green apples to red apples, you know what I mean, close enough. And what we did is Braintree is currently planning a new middle school. Their enrollment's 800 with a square footage of 145,000 square feet. Their cost of their building is about $69 million. When we compared that with Rockland's elementary school, which similar size enrollment, 760, little smaller square footage, they were at $64 million. So like I was saying, red apple to green apple, kind of very similar. So when we looked at them, it wasn't this disparaged cost that would you know, keep us from going after this kind of middle school design or option that we looked at. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, I, I um... Just want to um, be sure our, uh, my fellow school committee members understand our role in building a new school is the school committee is responsible for choosing the program that will be met by whatever school gets built. The school building committee's job is to do the build, build it, find a place, get it, um, get it built. Um, but the the decision. Uh, our recommendation for what we're building uh, is is really key, and and that was as as this concept has been sort of bubbling up and and gaining momentum in school building committee, we agreed that it was time to bring it back to school committee to discuss that you all have your 
share your thoughts and questions um, about it and, and to get a sense of, of um, how, how we feel about that. Um, but I, I also want to welcome Principal Bill Fish from the middle school. Um, um, Member White and I met with Superintendent Jett and Principal Fish um, a couple of weeks ago to talk about this possibility. And um, I, I just thought it was important to have them both here to share their perspectives on, on this project as well. But I'd like to just give Principal Fish a moment to uh, respond if, if you'd like to. Of course, Ada, thank you. Uh, and then good evening, everybody. Um, you know, a few weeks ago, as, as Ada mentioned, uh, Superintendent Jet and I met with her and, and uh, Member White. Just uh, they share the the momentum that this uh, concept has gained through the through the school building project, uh, and I appreciate them asking me and us what you know sort of from a educationally what might this look like for our students. Because at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. And you know, there's a handful of uh, just in that discussion, handful of advantages or opportunities that we see as coming to the fore, um, you know, with uh, with having uh, a second middle school and, and by intentionally um, narrowing its focus as you know a five six school and a seven and eight school versus you know two uh, five to eight schools. The, I mean, first and foremost, as as is the charge of the building. Um, committee is the fifth elementary school would not help to alleviate the enrollment uh, or the space crunch at the Pierce as it, as it currently is. Um, but beyond that, and, and I appreciated that, you know, Sean came right out and, and acknowledged that and, and showed the, um, the data as to why, but, you know, as we think about what this may look like um, in having uh, two you know, sort of the breakdown of, of the grade span by introducing the fifth grade to the middle school span, but also breaking it down into a lower and upper middle school, uh, having the opportunity to integrate our students in as a as a whole group at an earlier age uh, is something that I think would be uh, a significant educational uh, and social advantage to having um, to bring what would would be students from all four elementary schools together a year sooner. Also, just having a smaller span, you know, one building that's serving grades five and six, another building that's serving grades seven and eight. I think just really helps to uh, narrow in the on the zero in on the focus of the age and the population of students that we're working with and, and supporting to develop. Um, but there's definitely some practical uh, things that happen. And Superintendent Jet, as a former high school principal, spoke to this articulately. We talked about how much office space is currently being consumed at the high school campus right now by district-wide offices. Um, you know, James was saying it's it's somewhere in the range of like ten or twelve different offices that um, sh were we to um, build another uh, middle school that would open up space in the current Pierce building to distribute some of those district wide offices uh, in there in um, helping the the high school to eventually accommodate you know the space issues that they're going to have to negotiate. So um, I think that this is. Um, you know, while it's certainly in concept mode, there is an opportunity here, one, to, to address, uh, you know, through the school building project to address um, enrollment and space issues and doing it in a way that uh, is thoughtful and strategic in meeting the needs of our, of our children. Um, you know, there are definitely, would be, there would be some challenges that we would have to negotiate should this um, come to pass. And, you know, one of the first that comes to mind, and I think about this with my parent hat on, is that this would introduce an, an additional transition. Um, it's not just fifth to sixth and eighth to ninth grade. You know, there would be an additional transition during a pretty crucial time in our kids' development. But, um, you know, in thinking about what, what should be a, a, a small, both smaller and um, narrower grade span. I think that the advantages of, of having students, smaller groups of students in a, in a tighter age band um, would outweigh the, um, you know, not having done the research, you know, full, you know, full disclosure would like, would seemingly uh, have a lot, a lot of advantages. Um, you know, another challenge we'd have to just anticipate sort of coordinating the programming between the two campuses. You know, we're at Pierce right now, we currently service nearly a thousand students with a full span of not just, you know, academic, 
and curricular, but co-curricular and, and extracurricular activities that um, just the coordination between um, whether we're talking about two unique schools or one school with an upper and lower campus or just a number of, of resources through before and after school programs and clubs and activities that are that um, really serve to enrich students' school experiences that we would just need to uh, think about if our students and staff are potentially being uh, spread out over two campuses. But again, um, in, in concept, it, that doesn't seem like it's something that we wouldn't be able to overcome. Um, one thing that I would, whether we as a school community or as a, as a building um, committee look at, uh, the Needham Public Schools, and I want to say it was about 10 years ago, added, because for the same reasons, uh, an additional school, they have a standalone sixth grade school, so possibly as a, as a school community looking at that model, uh, my understanding is that that was driven by an enrollment crunch similar to what we're experiencing now, uh, and the solution there was to introduce um, a sixth grade school um, as a way, it, both for space and, and sort of um, in thinking about uh, the, the transition from elementary to middle school. So there are other districts that uh, have done this work uh, already, and I think it would behoove us to um, to tap into those into into our net, you know our network to learn more about that as well. Thank you, Principal Fish. Um, and I, I know that Superintendent Jett um, also has some comments to share. I wonder if Superintendent Jett, we can let the school committee members ask their questions and maybe you can share your thoughts at the end, if that's okay. Um, so I'd like to just open it up for any questions that people may have. Sure. Um, sure. Uh, Member Ross Denny. I'm so pleased that every time we hear from this committee, there's some new iteration that just shows that we're getting smarter about this. I like the idea of, as soon as you show the diagram of the buildings, it immediately said there's gonna be a crunch at the middle school. So this was very creative. What would enrollment look like in the five to six building and the seven to eight building? Does anyone know those numbers? Sean, do you? Yeah, I've played around with them a little, a little bit. Little. So, and I know they're guesstimates. Yeah, it's. I think the fifth to sixth grade one would be about seven hundred, and I think it is seven hundred seven fifty, and I think the same would be for seventh and eighth grade. I've got the current numbers, but I've only got them for pre K to fifth. I don't have them for the middle school, so I'm kind of going off historical numbers previously. It means that Pierce will be bursting at the seams, which I think is is the reasonable. Goal. Yeah, exactly. You basically be stripping one of the grades out of there, freeing up, you know, uh, space there. And I have a question about whether or not we have the ability to make this new building a flexible space. So when there are times when the elementary enrollment is off versus the middle school enrollment off, that building could become an elementary style facility versus a middle school style facility. I just think that it will, it will buy us some longevity. Is that something that's possible? I don't see why not. Um, I, you know, I mean, I, I think having the preschool already there and, you know, classrooms, I, I, I don't know middle schools as much as I've studied the elementaries as much as I can. But I think if you're taking a middle school classroom and converting it to a grade school classroom, first to fifth, I think you'd have the ability to do that. Um, you know, my, my main thing with this project, and I want to say to everyone is, um, I'm trying to do this one school project to address everything. Um, the main thing we're running into right now is the land. We don't have land. Finding this land was very hard, very difficult. The school you build now, 10 years, 20 years from now, do we have to do another school? It's going to be extremely difficult because the land is kind of getting gobbled up very quickly. And then my last question was, how did the neighborhood meeting go? Um, was there a lot, was, it, was the general um, sentiment enthusiastic or was it, were there concerns? There, it, it is a mix. So obviously we'd be taking conservation land that is troublesome to you know certain people. And I, I fully agree with that. Um, but the, the crisis that we're in for the schools right now, as far as the over enrollment and what you're gonna experience over the next couple of years, it, for me kind of outweighs that a little bit. And mainly the, the the land we're taking is conservation land. We're not taking it, we're swapping it. So what we're trying to do is educate people on this. So, well, the land across the road that's gonna become conservation land is not conservation land right now. 
the ratio that we give up from what we're taking is roughly, for rather than use the, because the exact acreage isn't known, but if you take an acre of conservation land and you use this article to transfer it, you have to give up additional, more than an acre back, some ratio that gets negotiated with the attorney general. So the concept of us taking conservation land, technically we are, but we also giving back more conservation land or converting more town land to conservation land. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Dr. Craighead? Um, that, that was one of my questions was the, um, was the ratio, like how much we were giving up versus how much in the swap. So thank you for answering that. Um, my other question, well, first of all, I want to say this is a wonderfully creative um, solution to all of the problems and, and moving the pre-K, moving some of the central offices to this space, um, just moving things around in this way is just so smart. Um, so thank you to the committee. Um, but my main question is in looking at the plot of land the sort of L shaped or kind of awkward L um, behind the football field. Um, I, I'm worried about the size of that plot of land. What can be put on it? What will, what might be put on it beyond just the school building? Because I'm worried about the pressure on all of the um, areas at the high school. I mean, they're well used already. Um, how much space is this middle school going to have? Or is it going to have a similar situation to what the Pierce has now, which is a very limited kind of yard area in the back where you can kind of put a soccer pitch on it and not much else? Yeah, and that right now I wouldn't be able to answer. I'm hoping once DRA uh, you know, develops some of their concepts, we'd be able to get into that. Um, you know, we, we just engaged them probably about our last meeting three weeks ago, uh, and they do have a concept, so we're going to see at our next meeting. Um, and, and as far as the acreage of the, the, the site, the site right now extends Pascal Road. It goes up like a hockey stick along the brook, and that portion of it is getting staying as conservation land. So the acreage that we have right now is about 8.3 acres for that whole parcel. What that hockey stick is going to remain, I don't know the acreage, so that's why I really don't want to talk in specifics of what that remaining acreage is going to be. Thanks. Hmm? Dr. Carroll? Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this update. <clears throat> um, and Dr. Fish, you actually, you anticipated a lot of the kind of programmatic questions that I was thinking about as the presentation was happening. Um, and you really helped me, I think, think in a new way about the advantages developmentally. And so thank you very much for that. Um, I do have just two, a question and a comment, I guess. Um, so the question is, and this may not be something we can talk about tonight, but I understand that we're sort of going um, going back to the concept a little to the concept stage in order to you know make sure we're doing the right thing and like using the resources most wisely. Um, but can you speak to how this change would impact the timeline or like for example um, MSBA like? Or would we start over um, to kind of go into their queue if that was something we were going to yeah, do? So or how would that work in terms of delaying the ability to um, end up with a building? Yep. So that's actually a question. So this was brewing for me early on uh, at the beginning of this year. And I kind of internally kept it kept it quiet for a little bit because I didn't want to disturb our, our SOI that we were doing with MSBA previously. Mm -hmm. um, and then after we didn't get accepted, I've always, as we talked about at our last meeting, I wanted a plan B for different things and this was one of them. Um, so the good thing is talking with MSBA, even though we submitted for overcrowding priorities, I think it was two and four, and you know we stated that we might want to build a new elementary school, they're open to whatever solution we come up with. 
Okay. So if this middle school addresses those priorities, they're on board with it and it'll still fund us. As far as timing for everything, it doesn't throw any timing off. We were at a conceptual phase for everything that we were doing. Mm -hmm. If anything, right now, we're, we're, we're far further ahead than we were uh, before. And if this was to set us back, I, I would have thought about it a little bit more, but it did not. It's not. Great. Okay. Thank you for, for confirming that. Um, the only other thing I was just going to mention, because I didn't want it to get lost in the shuffle of this big and um, long, longer term conversation, but you, I, you did include the slide with the modular classrooms. And, you know, I think we need to keep remembering that this is something that I think it's we as a school committee will have to confront very soon as far as what we're doing um, in, you know, it sounds like from this presentation and from conversations up to this point, like, is it as is it for next year? Is this part is this part of the budget we're talking about now? Looking towards next year, is it the year after? But um, you know, I just realized we haven't discussed that in, uh, really in, in in a while. So it seems like it's something we need to have on our agenda soon. So I will just I will just share that Bill Ritchie is on our facilities subcommittee. And it's on his um, budget for not for the fiscal year that we're planning for now, which is next school year, but the year after, with a price tag of about three million dollars is what he's got put, you know, on paper right now. So that's. I think I think that he has a uh, um, uh, three hundred thousand that first year, and then the three million, three million. afterwards. The three hundred thousand is more for. A, Design, design, design and planning, planning. yeah, right. So it's, it is coming really soon. So yeah, yeah it's, it's a yeah. good point. part of the part of our capital um, um, expenditure plan. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and if I could kind of chime in on that too, this is this is the similar again. I think of how I ended my last presentation of you know for us as a committee, we're looking at going with MSBA, and MSBA has this like seven year timeline associated with it. Um, whereas if we go this on our own and not kind of jump through the modules that MSVA has and try to shorten that timeline, what are those extra costs at the end of the project or, or the end of the project that we'd have to do to the schools and what's that cost and how does it compare against the offset from MSVA? So for us, you know, me personally, I would prefer to build the school as quickly as possible because I think the escalation of construction costs over that period and the modifications for additional classrooms and stuff like that outweigh that kind of reimbursement. Uh, but that's something as a committee, after we get the land done, after we decide what type of school we're gonna do, there's another subcommittee within my, uh, our overall committee that's focusing on that. Yeah, thank you, Sean. I, thank you. I guess I'd just like to chime in that of all the school committee members, I probably have the most reservations and questions about this plan. Um, I hear how it addresses the space needs of our children, but I don't see it yet how it addresses the academic needs and the developmental needs and the community needs of the different age groups that you're talking about. And for me, um, moving forward, as we think about this, I would like more conversation around that. Asking students to make transitions multiple times is challenging, particularly at that age in middle school when families are less engaged than they are in, in elementary school and they are in high school. Middle schoolers are unique in their development and they're unique also in their family engagement in school and what middle schools want from their parents. And that, that alters from elementary to middle to high school. Looks very different in high school when you're a parent and you re-engage with the community in different ways. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of the children that have special needs and different things like that, making those transitions multiple times, building communities, which is also a key element to running a high quality public school system, right? Those are the factors that seem very out of wonk for me when I think about making two years, fifth and sixth grade, and then ask everyone to move again to seventh and eighth grade, and then ask everyone to move again to the high school. So I'm not saying this is creative and imaginative, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm like Beverly, like member Ross Denny said, I'm, I'm amazed and I'm, I'm humbled this evening by so much of the creativity of the people in Milton, but I have real 
developmental questions about it and academic questions that I think before I, like, as we think about this, I would really need to hear someone help me understand. I couldn't find any other district that had this kind of model. Yes, there are some districts that move the kids, the sixth grade stays in elementary school or fifth grade moves to middle school. Mm -hmm. but no district that's just seventh and eighth, fifth and sixth, and then and then there's no model like that. We could be innovators. I'm not saying it's not a good idea. But I, I have a lot of questions about how this change, while it addresses the space issues, impacts development, education, and community engagement in our community. So those are just my big picture questions as I think about, and I really thank you all. I know how hard you've been working, and this is a very creative solution. I would also like to say the pre-K would have been better at the high school, as Superintendent Jet knows because you can have high school students work with preschoolers. Um, and I think about how the Tucker community was not happy with us about moving their preschoolers when we went when we went around this the first time. So anyway, so I just have a lot of 30,000 feet question things and then some more detailed ones that I would really need to think more and have more answers to um, as we think about this. Um, sorry, remember Ross Denny, you wanted to say something? No, I, I do want to um, piggyback on, on what you just shared and, and something that Bill had said earlier, because I did say to myself, they would have multiple transitions, but the other option is you might do a four, four through, two, four through eights, like split them the other way. But Bill had mentioned, what does the research say about transitions in that age? And I think the best way to answer that is to actually look it up. And so we can actually weigh realistically what the what the pros and cons are and make an informed decision. Because right now, it would be a real big guess on my part, but it sounds like Bill has done some other work and you have some of your experience that you bring to this conversation that should help um, inform our decision-making. 100% agree. I think that the research is the key to try. And we can be innovators. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with being an innovator. Milton has been innovative in the past. Um, I just would really, it's a big decision impacts a lot of students, impacts the way we think about our district as a community. And it, that matters. It would change identities in different ways, um, in different time frames. They then they get changed right now. Just something to think about. Yeah, I I shared shared some of those concerns, Marga, but I have to tell you when I spoke with Principal Fish and Superintendent Jed about this, it it really um swayed me, um, particularly Principal Fish, which is why I asked him to come, um, because I because he did speak about it in developmental terms, which is the way I, I'm used to looking at education. Um, and um, I, I don't know, if Principal Fish, if you want to make any further comments on, on this issue. Yeah, no, I think it's a real concern. And it's something that, you know, there, there's the, um, Beverly, I appreciate you punctuating that point. I think that there's more research that needs to be done to be sure that, uh, or to understand what um, you know, what are the advantages and opportunities, and also the potential challenges and the, that we we might encounter in the in the model that is being described. Um, you know, I, I think that um, I do think that I do, you know there are other there are other districts that have. We're not the only school district that has an enrollment crunch, but. You know, I think we need to look to our other other communities that have had similar experiences and and use them as thought partners and how um, you know how they've uh, worked through the troubleshooting process because I'm, you know, the districts I'm aware of that have similar uh, challenges are, are are those that have similar I think profiles and pride in their in their school systems as as we do. So I think that there's a lot that can be learned from from both from the research as well as from the experiences of, of others. But um, you know, at the end of the day, this is this is a real challenge. Like this is a this is um, as a community, this is something that we're we've we've we have to confront and, and know that um, there's oh there's there's going to be um, opportunities and challenges on both on, on any side of the decision that we make and, and we we do our research and we um, we put our our trust in that, and that, um, that we're, we're making decisions in the best interest of our kids in our community, and um, and that and that's that's where that goes. And again, this is still, I think, a very preliminary part of the conversation. And again, I go back to you know, having a great deal of gratitude for the work that Sean and, and the school building committee have done. Um, you know, I think I would would caution all of us remember that, that it's still early on, and there's work to do. Um, 
but there there is um, at least developmentally um, and educationally there's some there's some interesting uh, and potentially exciting upsides to to rethinking the model around around the grade spans. And I wonder if we can turn to Superintendent Jet to say a few words to wrap this up. I, I think the, the biggest thing that uh, Sean O'Rourke said was securing the land and determining whether or not it was going to be a middle school or elementary school. And whether we do a five through eight or whether we do the five, six, seven, eight, I still think it's important because by being a middle school, one way or the other, it helps alleviate not just the elementary, not just the middle school. It helps alleviate some of the pressure that's eventually going to uh, trickle up to the high school. Uh, we talked about the 40B projects that are coming online within the community. So even though we have those projections, we don't know the true uh, <laughs> the true numbers there. And the reason why, um, and we focused on the five through six, seven through eight, uh, because it, and we did acknowledge the challenges around uh, the multiple different transitions, but putting the seven through eight up at the high school, what are the things that was considered? Margaret, you stole the thunder about the restoration of the childhood uh, child studies program, because now you have all of those pre-K programs in one building. We used to have a challenge at the high school. We put 15 kids with 15 elementary or pre-K students in the class in that big room. That was tough. Now you spread it out amongst those class. Now you have two to three students in each of those classrooms. I think it's a more meaningful, a, better, a more richer experience for not only the, the high school students, but definitely the elementary students and more supervision and easy access for the teacher to work with those students. I also thought it was a good thing because there's some shared responsibilities in terms of uh, drama, in terms of activities and things like that, where you have a eighth graders who are or intramurals and sometimes we have waivers for athletics and things like that. It's a nice campus feel. Um, but going back to the uh, the the uh, fifth, the sixth grade, as a former principal and not getting into all of the research, the biggest thing when students transitioned from fifth grade to sixth grade, it was parents who were concerned about uh, seven and eighth graders <laughs> mm -hmm. and keeping their, their one year removed from their peers who were in the fifth grade the year before. And so, you know, that's why I, I, I like that idea. But I think the biggest thing is, it's a nice problem to have. We either determine if it's five through eight, and then we talk about how do you redistrict some of the students who gets to go to that new school. So when we talk about the concern about the, the community, who gets to go to the new school, who gets to stay at Pierce, no disrespect, Dr. Fish, <laughs> some people might want to go to the new school. Um, but there's shared resources. And, and then also in the middle school, there's minor, 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 but this cost savings on a couple of things because oftentimes it's your seventh and eighth graders who participate in your uh, intramural type sports where they travel and they go and it saves on some of that transportation. It helps with some of the transition work from uh, the high school, I mean, the middle school to the high school. It's all walking distance. Um, so everything is pretty much here. And I think we talked about it or Bill alluded to it. There's something that I used to say as a high school principal, when these new buildings were built, um, central office being in these buildings was supposed to be temporary. So I can't be hypocritical and say now that I'm in a position I want to stay in the high school, but it also frees up space. Our suite typically was supposed to be slotted for guidance with the superintendent's conference room as a career center, uh, from my understanding. So I think there's benefits, but uh, I think quick, not quickly, but in the near future, we could talk about what that looks like. But I do think a middle school, depending on whatever model, five to six, seven to eight, or five to eight in both settings, I still think the middle school is the best option because it helps district-wide with the uh, overcrowded. Great. Thank you. Member Rosemarin, can you give us a sense of when uh, a school committee would have to make a decision to alter the plan we voted on previously? Well, I'm not exactly sure that the, we we have engaged uh, DRA to do conceptual drawings for us, and, and we've asked them to give us an idea of both an elementary school and a middle school so we could see see the what those might look like on the um, property that we're looking at. Um, but beyond that, I don't know, Sean, if you have any further sense in terms of our timeline 
I don't. I heard back from MSBA today on the decision for the SOI. It potentially could be December and it could be March. They're not putting a timeline on it. Um, I know the initial uh, modules that they have you go into, there are alternate studies. So, you know, I mean, I assume this would be an alternate of, you know, elementary and middle school that we could look at on the same site. Uh, but I don't know the exact time frame. I would say probably sometime this time next year, um, something like that. I don't think it's anything immediate that we would need an answer by the end of the year. Um, but, you know, the, the one other thing if I could say too is, you know, as a parent, initially when we talked about these element, doing as an elementary school, it's hard to get buy-in from a lot of parents because the timeline they were on, none, none of the kids really born now if it was an elementary school would experience it. Having it as a seventh and eighth grade one, I think gets a lot of buy-in from the community. This is gonna be one of the most expensive construction projects for the town. And, you know, with that, we need as much buy-in as possible on this project. So having a seventh and eighth grade school that knew that everybody goes through, I think gives a lot more buy-in than two middle schools, as James was alluding to, that would need to make decisions on districting. And that's one of the reasons that I, as a parent, like that, like that kind of model. Superintendent Jet. Yeah, I was just gonna add one more thing and put emphasis on to me the possibility of moving forward without the um, Massachusetts School Building Association. Again, we're talking, if you look at the Pierce, the Pierce Middle School had the most substantial changes to their, their, their complex over there with the light, similar to the uh, Collicott Cunningham, the library, the language lab, we were able to do that. We removed the computers because we have the laptops in the hands of their one-to-one -one school. So we were able to do that and utilize that space, converting space behind the, um, uh, the circulation desk, turning the adjustment counselor's office into two, you know, making one room into two. So there's a lot of changes that are happening. And the longer we go in all of the money that we invest in those renovations, then what do you do with those things once you're building a project? So on top of the building project is going to continue to increase in terms of, I think if I'm not mistaken, Ada and Sean, Bill Ritchie was estimating anywhere from eight to 10% yeah, in terms of the increase, I could, uh, I don't want to quote them incorrectly, but that's, that's tough. And so yes, yeah, something to think about. Correct. Escalation in construction costs, especially over the past couple of years has been skyrocketing. Um, my main thing, when I look at the enrollment numbers, like I said, it's about a 2% average increase every year. 2% of the 2,300 that we have right now is 46 students every year. So round it and say 50. With a seven year timeline, that's an additional 350 students. You know, it's simple, simple round math that we have there. There's not space for 350 students, you know, over seven years. So those are the things that I look at when I really dig in the numbers that, you know, have me concerned that I wanna get this done quicker rather than later, so. Well, thank you all. I mean, we have no doubt that it will get done. Um, um, I have a lot of faith in this team here, uh, particularly I know that members of Marin and member White and, and, and all at Tron and the committee have been working hard and diligently. I do know there's a lot of conversation we would have with the community because we spent a lot of time with the community the last time that we, before we voted as a school committee. So I know that I don't have to tell that to this committee, the importance of engaging um, the community in the conversation and helping them um, be a part of the, the final decision. But I thank Principal Fish, Dr. Fish, and Shauna Rock and, um, and and all of you tonight for this presentation. Lots to think about, good times to come. Good problem to have as Superintendent Jett said. Yes, thank you. Thank you for, for allowing us to bump up a little bit in the agenda. Um, okay. yeah. and, and I was also thinking about the, the public forums that we're talking about doing for a school committee that, that we might do one of those public forums on this issue yeah. and get um, people's input. I think that's a great idea. Opportunity. Thank you so much, Sean. Amazing, you. amazing you guys are. I look forward to walking to see the new space someday and being there when you cut the ribbon or whatever they do then. I have no idea. <laughs> Thank, you. Thanks. Thanks for uh, Thank you so much. So guys, I, re I recognize that it's almost 930 and it's very late and that many of you have to be um, out of the house by 5 a.m. So I'm trying to strategize and think about the rest of the meeting and what we need to do first and foremost and prioritize to get done tonight and what we think we might be able to push to the 20th 
um, to finalize. So I'd love some brainstorming and thinking with you all, how much brain power you have right now left in you and the importance of the work that we still need to do. Plus, I think we have an executive session if I'm not mistaken. I left part of my brain at school today. Yes, Dr. Craig. We do have executive session and, and I am that um, hypothetical person you're talking about that has to get up early tomorrow. Um, I, I for finance, we have to approve the vendor warrants tonight. So I can save a discussion at the 23 budget, um, which I have ready until next meeting. I would like to do policy as well. I think that's important, Dr. Carroll. What are your thoughts around that? Because you have another policy meeting, I think, in this month, yes? Um, we have one on the 18th. Um, and I, so this was, my preference, if we can um, open this for discussion, just to gauge yes. sort of where that goes, um, because we do have a number of other policies that are in process and waiting to be considered. Yes. Um, and so to know how much more work we need to do on this would be important for planning how we go forward with those things. I'm trying to get a sense of what we should do about the goals, because we have our goals and superintendent's goals. Mm -hmm. Remember, Ross Denny sent me um, a, a suggestion about uh, a, a social, a social emotional goal to add to our goals. And I did have some questions around the finance piece of financing the curriculum ad adoption and stuff. And I know um, we have to think about and approve superintendent get jet schools. Member White, were you going to say something? I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say that I, I would be willing to think about postponing discussion of our goals because I think it's going to be lengthy and complex. But um, personally, I'm ready to vote on James's goals because I think, I mean, I think they're the some of the finest goals I've ever read in my whole 20 plus years of education background and reading, writing my own goals and reading goals of superintendents. I think they're excellent. So I'm, I'm ready to vote on that tonight and um, would like to maybe think about doing our goals the next time. Okay. I know that some people might have some suggestions about goals, um, as some suggestions or thoughts about superintendent Jet's goals. So that's fine. We can certainly do that this evening. Um, I, um, I'm Dr. Craig, and I'm counting on you about the MASC delegate. The meeting's in November, yes? The meeting is in November, yes. Right. Uh, I, I know we don't have to vote on the resolutions tonight. We do not, no. Right. So we can, um, we can do that on the 20th, but we can't do it any later than the 20th because the meeting will happen before. Right. Our next All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for helping me think this through. I know it's late and I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but I also have, we have important work to do. So um, I'm thinking then we can talk about, we can, we can probably appoint an MASC delegate if anyone thinks they're going to the meeting. Would you please remind me of the dates? I think it's like November 6, 7, I want to say, let me look it up. I'm sorry. It's that um, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of the First, oh God, I wish I had my calendar with me. I'm going to look it up right now. Um, I just want to say that usually I do this, and I like this meeting quite a lot, and I've gone every year that I've been on school committee. This year, I have um, an accreditation meeting, a three-day accreditation meeting that I have to be at, so I cannot attend. It's November 3rd through November 5th. Yes. I might be able to go. Oh, yeah, I'm actually quite shocked myself. I can't confirm it tonight, but okay. So we can, Dr. Carroll. Yes, yeah, sorry. No, oh. Lizzie, if you would like to go, if that's. This <laughs> is like no. sorry. I don't. I have a question about our agenda, not about the. Okay, Fine. we'll go back to that. Thank you for reminding okay. me. So we're going to talk about Superintendent Jet's goals. Okay. Well, um, that's my okay. question. Yes, actually. Okay, go shoot. So I'm actually wondering. Um, I'm, I, I hear what you're saying, Betty, um, but I also know that there, I think there were some questions raised in the last discussion a couple of weeks ago about Superintendent Jett's goals, and I'm not sure whether those questions have been able to be completely answered or resolved. Okay. So I'm just wondering whether it might be beneficial to provide the time to really get those answers if we could also postpone, like continue to look at the goals together and do that next time. Sure. That's Thank just a, an alternate 
Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you for bringing me back to my to my original plan was to alter the agenda together and then move forward. So I agree with you that I, I because um, member Ross Denny had reached out to me as well. So I think if we take the goals and we just move them, plus the vote on the resolution um, and the delegate to the next meeting, that's fine. We just take the chair's report and we move it, okay? That way we have time to think about everything. Yes. Dr. Carroll and then Superintendent Chet. Oh, just just a quick question. You're, are you talking about the MASC resolutions? Yes. So just for my benefit, since I, it, I, I know that the attachment we have to look at is a number of different resolutions. Can you just, since we're doing this next time, can you give a preview yeah. to help us be prepared? Yes. Do we so, take those one by one and sort of yeah. vote about whether we, as a committee, are adopting that resolution? Yes, that's what we do. Okay, we look great. at the resolutions and then we vote as a committee, whoever the delegate is, to take our vote to the committee. Thank you. To the big committee. To okay. the big committee. Right. So um okay. Is everyone okay with, with that that we're just gonna not do the chair's report right now, move to finance and policy? Okay. Thank I really appreciate you guys helping me think that out. All right. So Ms. Um, Dr. Craighead, finance, here you go. Okay. Um Let's see. Um, okay, so we're only doing vendor warrants tonight. Um, we have two and I'm gonna do them separately. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve vendor warrant um, number 14 payable on uh, September 30th in the amount of $455,392.63. Do I have a second? Second. Um, all in favor? Can I see everybody? One, two, three, four, five, six. I can see everyone. Thank you. That's six to zero. Um, and full disclosure, the reason I'm reading like this is that I, one of my contacts was hurting and I took one out, which means I can barely see this thing. But um, okay, so I'd also like to make a motion to approve vendor warrant number 15, payable on uh, October 7th in the amount of $258,431.95. Second. Second. Okay, um, all in favor? Raise your hand. Okay, that's five. Anyone abstaining? That would be one. So it's 501 on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Craig. And we look forward to a, a, a budget update next time. Robust, yes. <laughs> All right. All right, it's policy, my favorite. Before I um, open the conversation about policy, um, could I just ask one question pertaining to the vendor warrants in general? Yes. Um, so I, I know that a couple of different people have actually asked me, um, who community members who watch the meetings, mm -hmm. sort of what are, <laughs> where they could understand what the vendor warrants are or um, kind of how we like share that information. Um, so I just put that out there as a question because it's been asked of me and I'm just not sure what the answer to that would be within the process that exists, which I understand is a technical process for just, you know, paying the um, contracts that, that are in our budget, right? So I just wanted to mention that though. Um, Dr. Craig, would you like to say something or you want me to? Do oh, you can, you can tag along to what I, uh, okay. I, you know, it's not just paying contracts. It's, it's really every, except for salaries, it's all of the money we spend. Um, everything from um, uh, referees for games to, uh, pencils uh, for Glover Elementary to uh, whiteboards at the middle school to every everything and uh, elevator inspections and the rest of it. Um, I believe because the budget is open that anyone can take a look at the vendor warrant. We actually have a, um, a digital mm -hmm. copy of the warrant itself is released to um, all I believe it's to all school committee members. Yep. I know yep. I get a copy of it every week okay. and you can go through and you can see yep. what the spending is. So if anyone wants to contact Milton Public Schools and get a digital copy of what is in the vendor warrant every week, um, you can. 
Um, there is also for um, my inspection, because I'm the one who's, who's given the duty of signing the vendor warrant, for my inspection every week are the actual receipts for all of the spending so that I can go through and see that um, food services has bought rolls from a particular uh, bakery or vegetables from Costa or whatever it is um, and just see whether those amounts, um, you know, sort of are valid, are in the right, um, are being charged to the right category and um, um, whether they tally up with what's on the vendor warrant that goes up to town hall. And by the way, the receipts go to town hall too. So um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Am I rambling? I'm rambling. No, you did a great Thanks. job. No, uh, and I think, yeah, years, um, but when I first came on the committee, um, Dr. Carroll, we would all sign the vendor warrant each week. They would come to a school committee meeting when we were all present and everyone would sign it. Mm -hmm. and, and there was the option that this, uh, the Commonwealth provided to it to, to anoint <laughs> or appoint one member of the school committee to review the warrant and to um, sign for the entire committee. And Dr. Craighead in her diligence as the finance chair and person who was wanting to look at the receipts every week volunteered to do that. So the school committee has the responsibility of signing the vendor warrant and the payroll warrant um, for the district. Um, every week or every other week, depending on when they come out. So those things, and and then perhaps Superintendent Dexter would like to add um, more because she works in finance. Yeah, just quickly, I think it's important to note that um, not only is that approved by Dr. Craighead and the school committee, but it also goes through several layers of approval, which include the principal curriculum director, um, depending upon who the department head is, myself, Superintendent Jett, as well as the finance director up at Town Hall and um, the town administrator. And so the school committee um, payments get rolled in with the town and then that's approved by the select board. So there's multiple levels of approval throughout the process. Thank you so much. I, you know, no, thank I you. I think that that little, that. I, we were streamlining yeah. the agenda, but I just feel like um, that could help explain to people who have that question. Um, so someone had asked us once in like in a conversation yeah. in a chat, I remember, yeah. and we thought that that would be something good to address. So this was a perfect opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So are we good to move on to yes, please, uh, Dr. policy? Thank okay. You so, much. Yes. so I will just keep, I'll just keep the report to this one item that we have to discuss tonight because uh, this is the thing that was, um, voted out of the subcommittee at our past meeting a uh, week before last, I think. Um, and um, I'll just note that in the discussion that resulted in this proposed revised version of the resolution, um, Somali Prak Martins was part of that discussion and her input as um, the senior director of equity is in is integrated into this version that we can discuss now. Um, just to back up one step, you know, this was a resolution that um, one of like the ones we'll probably consider next time from MASC. MASC had put forward this resolution um, on anti-racism and it was general uh, to any district that wanted to sign on to it. Um, it that was approved unanimously by the school committee in July of 2020. And so um, we wanted to revisit that given the work that we have in progress and to consider ways that we might update this resolution to more accurately reflect the work that is happening actually in uh, Milton Public Schools more specifically. So um, that was the discussion. I think we probably need a motion to uh, open this for conversation. Is that right? Yeah. So I make motion. A um, and I, I guess this would be the first reading of this resolution. Yes. Um, and so it would a um, motion to um, have a first, I haven't done one of yeah, this just have a first reading before uh, uh, have a changes, first reading changes, of the, changes to the uh, anti-resolution passed. 
anti-racist resolution passed in um, June of, two, or what year was it? 2000, July of 2020. July of 2020. July of 2020. Okay. Yep. So now we can open the floor for a second. Somebody? Discussion. Do we need second. to have a motion? If we're, are we going to vote tonight? If it's not a tonight. No, no. We're just going to consider the resolution. A motion Probably to, not. That's it. Not okay. going to vote if it's just a first reading. Okay. 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 Sorry, I'm still. Oh, that's okay. We're all that. learning. And it's okay. Fine. So just um, open it up for conversation. All right. Do you want me to share anything, Lizzie, or do you want to just? Oh, sorry. Um, well, I can do that. So, Charlene, mm -hmm. uh, we can put it on the screen if you want. Um, Charlene had sent the um, version out with the materials. Yep. Um, I can do it if you want. Then you can see everybody. If I can go back to where I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. There we go. And so the red lines just represent changes. Yeah, so this is the red lines that represent the um, conversation that we had in the subcommittee. Um, Dr. Carroll, do you want to share anything about um, were some of these changes suggested by MSAE and some incorporated from the district from the conversation of your subcommittee? Um, so these changes are um, just from from those of us who have looked at it here in Milton. Um, to my knowledge, MASC has not proposed revisions uh, to this resolution. Um, we just saw the revisiting of this as an important step as we prepare to craft uh, an actual policy for the district, uh, which will be a longer process. Um, and, uh, you know, I think having the resolution that feels really um, aligned with where we are as a district now. Um, is an important step to launch the process of crafting a more comprehensive um, policy around, around this topic. Great, thank you. Oh, member um, Rose. Ada, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say the, the thing I like about the changes is that I felt it broadened the perspective to um, really address equity um, across many different areas um, that uh, weren't all addressed in the original mm -hmm. um, anti-racism resolution. And I felt that it was consistent with the work that we've been doing in the district around equity and, and um, uh, I, I liked it for that reason. I agree. And I think it addresses some of the um, comments we received them from the community as well about naming other types of discrimination and isms that are, that uh, exist in in our community and in the in the broader community around us. Wonderful. Ada, do you uh, remember Rosemary? I'm so sorry. <clears throat> Yeah. Member Rosemary, did you want to say something? No, I was I was just going to comment. Now I don't I don't see it anymore. But well, the, um, about the um, the statement about um, 
the um, I can't remember how it was worded um, about discourse or public discourse um, that um, I think really um, is is germane to um, our experiences in in some of the public meetings that we've had this year. Oh yeah, whereas we as school district leaders yeah. call for discourse that rejects toxic incivility and embraces careful listening respect, openness to dialogue, and commitment to the truth. Yeah, I, I just think that it it's um, making a, a, taking a stand in that area, and, and that I think it's important, certainly for our work and for our community to, to work together to listen to one another and um, respect differing opinions and perspectives. Yes, thank you. That thank you for bringing that out to our attention and highlighting that in this conversation, Member Rostin. Sorry, I agree with all of your comments, and I would like to um, ensure that this is posted broadly. Maybe it's in the superintendent circular or on the website, so that the members of the public can see this. I know it looks really small for those of us whose eyes are getting old. <laughs> I think the quality of the revisions reflect. Um, the community sentiment, and I would love for people to have the opportunity to spend time with this new policy, um, and as well as it being highlighted amongst our faculty so they know where the district stands. Member White, go ahead. I just want to say that I thought the state, the statement and policy is very powerful, very transformational from what we had last year or in 20, 2000, yeah, it's 21. Um, and I, I, was, I was thinking as I was reading it, particularly because some of the younger generation in my family, my nieces and nephews of like challenging me all the time about moving Milton in a different direction and what we need to do. And I'm thinking as I was reading it, I'm thinking I'd love to see some of the high school students and some of the young people who are recent graduates take a look at that and, and see, you know, and respond to it. I think it's very powerful, so. Good work. Superintendent Uh Just to be clear, it, it is the resolution, not the policy. I mm -hmm. think the policy would be coming down. Uh, so just to be clear on that. Okay. Dr. Carroll, any final I thoughts? I think if we, if we eventually adopt this resolution or something like this, it would send us a uh, good signal to kind of launch the process of forming the policy. Um, so I think that they are definitely distinct, but also connected. Um, so I appreciate all of your feedback. Um, I'm My question from here is if, if this is the first reading of the policy mm -hmm. and it doesn't seem like there are any um, you know, su suggestions for how to take it back to the subcommittee and rework it to bring it back for a second reading, then how does this work? Do we just um, bring it back next time and vote on it? Yes, we do. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you may receive comments or thoughts from others outside the committee. Obviously, the committee votes on the resolution. Mm -hmm. um, um, you and I had discussed that in, in some communities right. get posted and people comment. Um, but Certainly, the committee will have the have a vote at the next at the next school committee, and we will adopt this resolution as adapted by the current um, school committee and the current policy subcommittee. I think it's an excellent um, resolution, and I look forward to adopting it and having it be part of our statement um, in the schools. Okay, great. And just just for the community to know, uh, we do intend to have that process of formulating the policy be. Uh, very an inclusive process where we have opportunities for community input, um, public comment, and all of that. So um, that will definitely be something we're looking forward to doing this year. Thank you. But thank you all very much. And I guess that will conclude the policy report for tonight. Wonderful. The last thing on our agenda was approval of minutes that we that was sent to us by um, Charlene Roche. Did everyone have a chance to look at the minutes from the meeting? Hold on, I can. They were the minutes from our September 22nd, 2021, which was our only last school committee meeting, but feels like it was a lifetime ago. It was only like two weeks ago. 
Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of September 22nd, 2021? So moved. So moved. Do I have any adjustments or corrections to be made to those minutes? Um, I did have one um, adjustment was uh, where it listed <clears throat> uh, in the um, visit with Lori Stillman that she also introduced to the committee, Margaret Carroll's and uh, Stormy, Stormy Learn, um, who will be taking over in that role. Okay. All right, we can we can um, ask um, Ms. Kennedy to make those changes or, or corrections. All right, so um, there there's a motion to approve the minutes with these changes. Is there a second? Second. Okay. We have to do a roll call vote because they are the minutes. So, Member White, yes. Member Rosemarin, yes. Dr. Craighead, yes. Dr. Carroll, yes. Member Rostini. <laughs> And myself, yes. Okay, I think that's six zero. All right. So um, the last thing is old business. We don't. I don't think have any old business to discuss. Um, so so I, I'm really sorry that the meetings are are. I used to get so upset the meetings were too long. I'm doing a terrible job managing them. I'm really sorry. I don't know what to say about that. Um, so at our next school committee meeting, which is on the 20th of October, we have the both the MSC resolutions and to vote a delegate. Um, we do have uh, here a capital request. Um, vote. I don't know if that's going to still happen, Dr. Craighead. Will that be happening? Um, I'm not sure that it will happen on okay. the on the 20th, and there's no need to rush it that quickly. So, given okay. that we're going to have a full slate, it looks like again next time, let's move it off into November. Okay. We're going to have Ms. Uh, Ms. Maselli come and report out to us at the next meeting. She's on our agenda as well, and then we'll have the school committee goals and superintendent goals. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask you guys about is I talked to. Um, uh, Member Carol, one day we were chatting about, um, we used to have on our school committee um, agenda, an opportunity for citizen speak response. We removed that last year um, because things got a little bit, um, I don't know, long and, and, and a little bit um, uncertain, but we could certainly add that back in because a school committee response would be an opportunity to answer questions specifically raised by other people. But uh, Member Rustin, you, you had your hand up first. I didn't mean to overlooked that so sorry oh so i agree with that but i raised my hand because there was one more agenda item that tell was me what it was because i don't have it written down it is um director prack martins is going to hear the district's plan for establishing um the um, reporting system for i think it was racism and sexual harassment i don't, I don't remember how it was couched but okay um dr spaulding had shared with us over the summer yep where the plan was was going to, I guess, fall out. So okay. um, she will be presenting what the district will be doing in response. Okay, so finishing um, the job, I should say. Susan Maselli is going to come and re report out, and then Dr. Pre and, and Director Preck Martins will come and report out. Two different things. Yes, Dr. Carroll. And um, two quick things. So there will be a policy yep. subcommittee report with yep. anti racism and hopefully something else. Yep. Um, I'll update that in time. Um, but um, the other thing I was going to mention is, if it's okay, I may also have a very brief report in my role as the liaison to the Milton High School student government. Yes. Um, I will be meeting with them next week. And I'll also be meeting with the Milton Youth Advocates for Change next week. Perfect. So I will be able to update on um, kind of how we can collaborate with the students. Yes, because the students attending, um, they're supposed to come to the meeting. Um, right. They have an active voice. I know they're just getting their 22nd day of school. I get it. Yeah. Um, so okay, have them come. Yeah. And they yeah, next, wanted to ask us. Maybe at the next meeting, I can report back on sort of some of what they're thinking about. And we could schedule then, you know, what, what they want to bring to different meetings coming up beyond that. Um, and I so we'll add a citizen speak response because one of the things we had a listening session before and we um, I I'm, I would be remiss to not thank Dr. Carroll so much for organizing um, the listening session and and to Stephanie O'Keefe for really supporting us in that initiative and as Member Ross Denny pointed out at the listening session over 30 people came to hear what their fellow citizens were um, having some thoughts about so I really want to thank everyone for participating you know there was some um, some feedback for us about that they feel a little awkward and there's no opportunity to engage with school committee members and we know that that's that's a that people would like to engage us 
And we just have to be mindful of the kinds of opportunities that we present because um, the only, um, I don't want to use the word power, but the only decision-making opportunities we have um, are when we're all together in a school committee meeting in an open meeting um, for the community. So, but opportunities to have a forum where we could have a conversation of back and forth and hear people's ideas is something that we're really looking forward to. Um, but just remembering that in those forums, we're speaking and listening, but decisions are only made at a school committee meeting when we're all together voting as a, as a legislative body. I know that's kind of a, a, a hard thing sometimes for people to understand, but I just wanted to make that clear um, that that's we're bound by that law um, to do something like that. So thank you so much, Dr. Carroll, for that. With that being said, we're going to adjourn this meeting and enter into executive session. Um, not to return to open meeting um, to uh, in preparation to conduct strategies in preparation for negotiations with union and non-union personnel or to collect, conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with union and non-union personnel in accordance with chapter 30A, section 21A2. Do I have a motion to adjourn to executive session? So moved. May I have a second? Second. This will be a roll call vote. Uh, Member Rostenny? Yes. Um, member White? Yes. Member Rose Marin? Yes. Dr. Craighead? Yes. And Dr. Carroll? Yes. And Margaret Eberhardt, yes. Thank you all so much. Um, have a pleasant day tomorrow, peaceful week.